Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, June 23rd, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Mike Consul, Director of Macroeconomic Analysis at the Roosevelt Institute, author of the just-released paper, Prices, Profits, and Power, co-authored with Nico Luciani. Then, Amani Badhaso, candidate for Congress in Minnesota's 4th District. And as of this morning... The Supreme Court has now found that there is, it is unconstitutional for a state to limit concealed carry to those who had a heightened need for self-defense. This will impact about 83 million people in the country. They have basically said, There's virtually no restrictions on why one can carry a gun in this country. Meanwhile, the January 6th panel to hear of Trump's attempt to weaponize the DOJ in his soft coup. Speaking of the DOJ, it has issued subpoenas to the Georgia Republican chair and other GOP election officials in two other states over the fake electors plot. The FBI is, in fact, investigating a Republican elections person in Nevada for the same reason. You're a fake elector. (laughs) Proud Boys trial delayed to make room for more January 6th uh, findings. The Eighth Circuit finds no constitutional right to boycott states. In other words, they can force contractors to sign a loyalty pledge to Israel. Census report, LBGT adults suffer twice the rate of mental health challenges as other adults. A new report, 401k experiment, seems to be failing as younger boomers are on track to outlive their savings. All this and more on today's program. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. I should say right off the bat, the IM works today. So stop IMing the word test. A um, lot of news today. We are, uh, we are jam-packed. And so let's get right into it. The um, For, well... Months, arguably years, um, we have been teeing up some of these uh, Supreme Court cases that uh, were uh, about to come down or were eventually going to come down uh, from this 6-3 conservative Republican court. And uh, a big one dropped today. There are still two big ones that are extant, at least ones that we have talked about. The... The decision on Roe v. Wade, essentially, and uh, West Virginia EPA case, which could uh, seriously inhibit uh, and and corrode our administrative state. But today, there were four decisions, I believe, that were were dropped down. Um, I've only taken a look at one, but this is the biggest one, and it's going to have the most impact on the most amount of people, and will undoubtedly lead to uh, both more people dying 
because they were shot and killed. And I think just a general sense of insecurity amongst the vast majority of Americans who do not see a legitimate reason for someone to be just walking around with a gun. Yeah. And just internal <clears throat> uh, domestic intimidation, a sense of that too. Like the, the vast majority of the guns that are going to be sold aren't going to be like people protecting themselves from like the authorities. It's going to be intimidating people in their lives. Uh, that's exactly right. And I would also, you know, I think if you follow that out too, it's going to inhibit uh, free speech. Um, talk about cancel culture. The person who brings that gun to the bar and um, gets into an argument, probably going to win. But here are the uh, the basics. We have we have talked about this many times in the past. I'm going to repeat uh, some of that. More than a century ago, that is more than a hundred years ago, New York State imposed a law that basically said, if you want to carry a concealed weapon for self-defense, you need to show a specific need for doing so. What that constituted, um, I think you can imagine. But you should know that about 65% of the people who go in front of um, or apply for that permit, a concealed carry permit, are approved. And there are about, like I say, um, I don't know, about 25 states. That may be a little bit less that have a similar requirement, Massachusetts, uh, there, there's more. I can't remember exactly how many, but, it, but it's about 80 million people. And um, this law was challenged. Two people challenging the law, Robert Nash and Brandon Koch, have license to carry handguns for hunting and target practice. But the New York authorities denied their request for unrestricted licenses for self-defense because officials said they could not show a, quote, special need for self-protection distinguish distinguishable from that of the general community. So, for instance, if you are, I don't know, maybe you're a DA and you've gotten a lot of threats, or maybe you've just gotten a lot of threats, or maybe you, um, you do some uh, housing inspection, or maybe, I don't know, arguably you're a repo person, I don't know. But you need to show some reason why you are in more imminent danger than your average person in New York City or walking around uh, in some other town. And uh, they could, like I say, 65 percent of applicants were approved uh, for an unrestricted license. This is according to um, a state analysis that was submitted to the court. Mark Joseph Stern uh, on a Twitter thread basically says this expands the scope of the Second Amendment. And remember, none of this, none of this was an issue until 14 years ago in the 2008 Heller case. None of it. None of it. That's why there was a law like this for 100, over 100 years in this country, because a conservative Supreme Court decided they were going to have a new interpretation of the Second Amendment. That's what's going on. They decided to have a new interpretation of the Second Amendment in 2008. And everything that is now happening with the Second Amendment is a function of that. One of the briefs mentioned, we have mass shootings. This is a problem. We want to limit guns and how many people can carry around guns in the city, let's say, or walking amongst us or in a bar. Because incidentally, that's next. The next thing is, how do you inhibit people from bringing them into schools? Like, what, where's the logic here? If it is a right that cannot be restricted by the state, 
If you can't be told we need a, a legitimate reason for you to carry around a gun, well, then what's the point of a permit process? Yeah, the Constitution says I should be allowed to defend myself, whether I'm at a preschool or CPAC. We're going to see. It's just a matter of time. All permitting uh, basically removed. I mean, I don't even know why. How, how, uh, there may be no point in having permitting at this point. If, if you can't be restricted in any way by carrying the gun. <clears throat> but that will fall. And then, like, you will not be able to go into spaces. There will be no safe, so safe spaces, snowflakes. Sorry. Um, but this, uh, Stern points out, uh, Thomas wrote the opinion. Alito wrote a concurring. This little thing just gives you a sense of how what kind of piss ant uh, Sam Alito is. Um, does the dissent, writing towards the dissent, think that laws like New York's prevent or deter such atrocities? Talking about mass shootings. Will a person bent on carrying out a mass shooting be stopped if he knows it's illegal to carry a handgun outside the home? Now, It's possible. It might make it harder for them. There may be trip wires that go off. And how does the dissent, he writes, account for the fact that one of the mass shootings near the top of the list took place in Buffalo? The New York law at issue, in this case, obviously did not stop that perpetrator. Just contemplate, just switch out this gun law for murder. The law against murder didn't stop this guy from shooting these people. Do you know what? The law against trespassing probably didn't either. The death penalty didn't. I wonder if this isn't a good argument for the nullification of all laws. It's so clear. Like, well, the problem with the New York law is that it didn't also ban those giant assault weapons. <laughs> Uh, maybe there's an argument for more restrictions, not less. That would be my reading. And, and the bottom line is, uh, Clarence Thomas says, none of this is relevant. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. We have decided upon a principle 14 years ago that we have now pretended has existed since the founding of this country, since the, the, since the writing of the Constitution. It just took us, it just took us about 200 plus years to find it in the Constitution. Thomas's opinion, according to Stern, for the court suggests that judges may not consider empirical evidence about the dangers posed by firearms when evaluating gun control laws. It is wholly irrelevant if they are effective. It is wholly irrelevant if they if guns are a problem in society. They are a God given and by God given, I mean Five conservative justices in 2008 uh, uh, right. They only may ask whether a modern regulation has some analog that is rooted in American history. This is just a bizarre assessment, particularly since in 2008, there was no Law rooted in American history that said everyone has the ability, an unfettered right to carry a, a firearm. It just didn't exist. And some like individual right to self-defense, which the Second Amendment doesn't even hint at with the well-regulated mil militia language. Not even a hint toward nope. that. Thomas overrules the two-step approach used by many courts of appeals when assessing gun control laws. Instead of placing an incredibly heavy burden on the government to prove that every regulation of firearms is part of the historical um, instead, I should say, placing a, a heavy burden on the government to prove that every regulation of firearms is part of the historical tradition, whatever the F that means. Um, you know, I don't know what to, to, to tell you, but this was uh, perfectly predictable. And more to come. More to come with the Supreme Court. And elections do have consequences, particularly um, 
you know, I, I, you know, in some instances, they get you a 6-3 court by hook or crook. In some instances, it causes the president to try and overthrow uh, the actual winner. So there are consequences. All right. Um, we're going to take a quick break in a moment so we can set up uh, Mike Consul's shot. Uh, just want to tell you right now, Just Coffee has a special promo that is going on. Usually, you use the promo code MAJORITY, get 10% off. You can buy the Majority Report blend. Right now, if you go for one week, I believe it is only, at justcoffee.coop, 25% off with the code MR25. Have you ever wanted to try the Majority Report coffee blend? Or even the WTF blend? Uh, Mark Maron's stupid show. Um, But there's also... Bike fuel. There, I mean, there's there's um, single source. There's all sorts of different coffees there. It is all fair trade. They are a co- co-op, completely employee owned outfit. They do great work in terms of like supporting uh, their sources, the Zapatista region and in, in Mexico, um, other farmers. It is all fair trade. Um, organic. Check it out, justcoffee.coop. This is the time. If you ever wanted to try some of these coffees or try different blends of the coffees that they have, they have a cold brew coffee. Now is the time to do it. And if you've never tried Just Coffee, do yourself a favor. Incredibly reasonable, whole bean or ground. You can get a five-pound bag, you can get a two-pound bag, you can get a, like a normal one-pound bag. Uh, check it out, justcoffee.coop. We're going to take a, a quick break, and when we come back, Mike Konzel of the Roosevelt Institute on uh, inflation, the measures that are being taken to, um, to deal with them, and what could be done that is better. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program, after too long a time, uh, Mike Consul, Director of Macroeconomic Analysis at the Roosevelt Institute, author of uh, the most uh, his most recent uh, paper, Prices, Profits, and Power, co-authored with Nico Luciani. Uh, Mike, uh, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me on. Okay, so let's let's start from uh some remedial uh things like what what when we say inflation what is the definition of inflation so the way economists generally talk about inflation is when there is more spending in the economy than the goods that are in the economy and so it pushes the price level up essentially demand is ahead of the the demand in the economy for goods is ahead of the supply of the economy of goods. There's a lot of nuance to that and a lot of ways that can break down, but that's the general way people approach it. Okay. And so where does the idea of like uh, capacity versus actual supply, right? Because we have a a unique situation, it seems, uh, coming out of COVID uh, where we did not have this dynamic pre-COVID. We had uh, very little inflation. Uh, it seems to me, but the, and the capacity to produce is there. Like we have the machinery and the structures, but we don't have the inputs in some instances in terms of like materials, because, uh, maybe there's, you know, a part of China has been shut down or, or we don't have, uh, the labor because, 
when I was flying, when I was an airline during COVID, nobody was flying. And so I fired a bunch of people and they all went off and got different jobs. And you can't just snap your fingers and get somebody who's like, I repair planes. Uh, I just, you know, uh, decided not to do it for two years or whatever, or uh, I am a, you know, uh, a flight attendant or whatever it is. You can't just wave your hand to get these people to come back because they weren't being paid. They found other jobs. Um, is there a difference? Is there a material difference between the idea of like, there's just so much demand that it outpaces the normal supply versus um, demand has come back quicker than our ability to sort of reinflate, uh, maybe poor choice of words, to reinvigorate the supply mechanism. Yeah, I think that's a great way to, to start with it. And I'd, I'd also go further in the supply, uh, in, in part, if, if, for instance, a large part of the price increase in our economy last summer, as it was last summer, is from automobiles. And that's very easily traceable to the fact that we just didn't make many cars in 2020. All the auto plants basically shut down for a period and waited to start up. And a lot of, for a variety of, of very weird pandemic reasons, notably a lot of like auto car rental places went into bankruptcy and sold off their fleets and had to repurchase them in 2021. There's a very concentrated spike in the auto industry, um, in, in prices for autos. And anyone who's tried to buy a car over the past year and a half has definitely experienced this. That's different than a generalized increase in price or um, the idea that too much demand is pumping in the economy. That seems like a very different story. It's also very different than the idea that we were just not producing enough in general. It seems like that's a very industry specific story that had a very specific question, uh, very specific set of challenges in the pandemic and reopening. And how much do you generalize from that? And that's been the big story of inflation over the past year and a half is um, it seems like a lot of different things are in play, that there's a lot of spending. People have built up a lot of savings. You know, There's a lot of checks and, and unemployment insurance to make sure that we survive this pandemic. There's also uh, a lot of really difficult industry and service specific stories about reopening and about coming out of this pandemic. That's a, just a very unique challenge. It's unlike any other thing we've had in generation. And so how do you balance that was the big question. That's the thing we try to tackle at this paper. And, and we should say that um, we, we, we talk about these nuances with the full understanding that the implications for uh, people who are dealing with increased prices, it's really, you know, it's irrelevant to their experience and to the, the hardship it creates on people as to whether it's this that's driving up prices or that's that driving up prices. But it's important to, to make these assessments as to know as to how to go forward, because some of the answers to inflation can really hurt those same people who are being hurt by inflation now, which is which I, I want to get to in just a moment. But where are we in terms of inflation relative to the rest of the world? So um, we were ahead of peer countries, and there's a, a lot of different countries that have a lot of different inflation and monetary systems and economies. But for a lot of our peer nations in Europe, which I think are a good benchmark, you know, in general, um, European countries have had um, much weaker inflation because they've had weaker economies. And that's important to realize is that not all inflation is bad, that a small amount is a sign that the economy is growing, that people are getting jobs, people are getting wage increases. You know, the austerity that came after the great financial crisis and Great Recession in the 2010s um, meant that Europe was already behind and, and slower, but for bad reasons. Now, we've had a bigger pickup earlier than Europe. Europe has since caught up to us generally. That's a little bit more related to energy prices and specifically um, Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. So as your point earlier, a lot of inflation right now is in food prices and uh, energy prices, notably the price of gas. Anyone who's been driving recently has noticed um, the price of gas has skyrocketed. And, and that's inflation in in the sense that prices have gone up, but it's directly caused or in large part caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And it's not derived from unemployment being too low or the economy being too healthy or say too hot in the way a car engine might be too hot. Uh, and that distinction though, obviously, as you said, doesn't matter a lot for households that are trying to deal with these costs. It matters quite a bit for how the Federal Reserve and policymakers react, because if they want to slam on the brakes 
and it's not because the engine's too hot, but because of this one specific problem, it's going to throw a lot of people in unemployment. It's going to slow the economy. It's going to slow down in the investments we need. And so that's, you know, getting into this is, is really important. And, um, you know, the cross nation comparison is important because it shows that other countries are also dealing with unexpectedly high inflation for a variety of reasons. Right. Because um, there are there are competing um, stories as to what's driving inflation. And I mean, this is ultimately where your paper comes in. There are competing stories that uh, that drive inflation, which um, would would indicate or end up um, prescribing different solutions. And and people should understand that these different solutions are often political choices uh, that we're making because there you can have mechanisms that can uh, impact inflation. And the question is, who's going to pay the price for that reining these things in? And the way that people avoid the the political taint on these choices is to pretend that the causes are something other than they are and therefore must be responded to. I don't mean to be so obtuse about this and we can maybe get more into the specifics, but um, you know, the argument that uh, we will hear the right uh, articulate and people like even Manchin, I think, well, I don't know if that's a distinction without a difference. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and folks like Larry Summers, uh, they blame the benefits that were like the unemployment benefits, like maybe the subsidies to health insurance, uh, for the unemployed, you know, Cobra was free for a while. Um, there was a child, uh, uh, tax credit that was, uh, given to, uh, people for a while. Um, two, two things I want you to comment on in terms of, of those things. Um, one is we needed to do that in a way that our peer countries did not because they already do that, right? Like we had to p put extra money into the economy in places that it isn't usually there because, and they didn't have to do that. So there, there was not the same differential. They already have a tax system that takes some of that stuff out of the, you know, the, the excess out of their system. We don't, um, because we don't do it on the higher end and provide this, these benefits on a regular basis, which we, you know, is obviously it shows that they have these sort of almost automatic stabilizers in these situations that we didn't have that would inhibit their inflation growth. I want you to comment on that. And then also comment on the idea that, we're six months out, seven months out from the last of the, any of these benefits, as far as I can tell. How could they still be having this level of implication, you know, of, of how could those specific payments have be implicating inflation now? So those two right. questions. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, when you compare the cross-country comparison, um, you know, we spent more. Notably, a lot of peer countries did not do a big stimulus in early 2021, like America did with the American uh, Rescue Plan. Um, a couple of things that are different among peer countries. Yes, we have a, we, pre Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we had a little bit higher inflation, but they still had higher inflation than they had expected and had on trend. Um, in exchange for that, if we, but you know, there's so many different comparisons. You know, we're a much more auto dependent country than a lot of European countries, and auto inflation hits our numbers a lot harder. The flip side is that our unemployment is significantly lower. You know, our unemployment rate is nearly three and a half percent. It's basically where it was pre-pandemic. European unemployment is still seven, eight percent. Um, they did a lot, a lot of support through the payroll system. Uh, now, they a lot of those countries have stronger unions, so that made it easier to prevent some abuses. Though, if you can imagine, if instead of us doing unemployment insurance in 2020 and 2021, just giving that money to employers, uh, that could have been very abusive. Instead, we have quite the opposite. We had enhanced UI allowed people to pick and choose the jobs and pick and choose the terms of the reopening of the economy, allowed people to quit their jobs and look for jobs better uh, that are better for them. So we've had this huge upgrade in people's jobs. You know, 
the um, wage growth, even real wage growth compensated for inflation has skyrocketed among the bottom 20 to 40 percent of workers, which is just unheard of in the early parts of a recovery. Uh, you know, there's been a big compression at the bottom half of the labor market. And I don't think that would have happened. I don't think that tran that real transformation and the opening for even more and bigger unionized uh, labor transformations would have been possible. And, you know, Europe might have had a little less inflation over the past year and a half, but now they're facing all this uncertainty going forward of Russia's invasion in Ukraine and others um, with a much weaker base where, you know, we're confronting higher inflation than what we want. The Fed um, is right to normalize, but is moving a bit too fast and a bit too erratically. And it's important that they keep calm and data dependent. And we have a lot of policy interventions from infrastructure investment, uh, you know, um, acts that have already passed that could be passing, you know, um, in investments that we could be making. Um, but we have a very strong labor market and very strong household balance sheet. So I think we come at this from a much, this period of heightened uncertainty from a much stronger period, a much stronger position of strength than we would have otherwise. And I think that's really important. Okay. And so, um, and, and is, is, I mean, so if I hear you correctly, those benefits actually sort of set people up into better jobs in some fashion. And, and th the, the increase in demand could be a function of that. Like this could be a knock on effect. I'm talking in terms of like it's inflationary impact. Yeah. So there's no evidence that wages are rising too fast and causing inflation. We know that the inflation we've seen has largely been recorded in corporate profits. And we can talk a little bit about that. That's where our paper um, right. at the Roosevelt Institute tries to intervene on. Um, you know, there was a big burst of wage growth last fall that I, I believe was the result of the collapsing of a lot of the more exploited of just in time labor markets. Now, you know, you see a lot of service sector businesses have to offer 15 or $18 minimum wages, um, which is a, a big burst of one time, you know, wage increases. Right now, wages um, have slowed down. They're still very high, uh, which is great. Um, you know, inflation is still very high, which is bad. Uh, and so the net is not, not great for workers. But there's no evidence that wages are the cause of our inflation um, troubles in the short term here at all. And so, I think a, a lot of criticism of that has been invoking that it could be a problem or it might be a problem someday, which um, I would not want to throw people out of work in order to prevent a problem that hasn't even happened yet. You know, like make people poor to prevent people from possibly becoming poor someday, I think is a really poor set of solutions when there's many other things we could be pursuing. Okay. So let's move into that because, and, you know, because there, I, I imagine there are some people saying, well, how is it possible that if you have more people with higher wages, um, particularly at the lower end of uh, the uh, the the income distribution, where you know um, a rich man only buys one loaf of bread a day or whatever it is or a week, and now you can have people who are actually like able to buy bread for the first time, you know, once a week. Um, how how could that not be inflationary in terms of creating more demand? And in the way that you establish that that's not the case is by looking at um, at what's happening in terms of, of profits and markups, right? Because if it was, why, is, why does profits give you a sense of what is actually driving prices up? Sure. So to give a sense of the way uh, economists, in the, in the academy and then also in the government and kind of like the policymaking public um, have been debating this, that there's a huge surge in corporate profits last year. And um, that is what has contributed to a lot of the inflation. There's a question of what to make of that. Do you say that that's the result of too much demand, that people just want to buy so much stuff and corporations can't keep up with them, so they raise prices to kind of ration it? Is it the result of supply chains and other supply issues that there's you know, only so many semiconductors to go around, the ports are backed up because we haven't invested in our infrastructure in decades, um, and thus profits are high because of the constraints that you know that they're moving in or is there kind of like a market power story that firms that have some consolidation or some sort of market power are able to kind of opportunistically use this crisis moment and this recovery to pad their bottom lines a little bit more than they should and we find some evidence for all of them and i went into this very agnostic i wasn't actually quite sure what i was going to find and we find that uh, and and th those profits are an aggregate category, right? They're like all the profits in the economy. So you can't actually break them into firms to look. But now that a little bit of time has passed, we are able to get 
these rich data sets of basically every firm that reports public profits and their public balance sheets to the government. And we're able to kind of do cross sections and look at them. And we find that their markups, their profits, how much more they're able to charge relative to how much it costs them to make goods, which they have to record for accountancy purposes pretty clearly, um, those skyrocket, th those go up across the board a little bit. So it does seem like demand has some small role to play in it. Um, and that's something that's appropriate for the Fed to start to raise rates very slowly to address, not this more erratic, aggressive way that they're doing. Um, however, that there's also really big shifts in industries. The financial sector has huge markups. Uh, a lot of shipping and energy extraction businesses have huge markups. Uh, a lot of things associated with semiconductors and our supply chains have huge markups, which imply that the supply story is also very relevant. And then last, firms that were very profitable before the crisis were even more profitable after the crisis, which implies there's probably a little bit of shenanigans going on in the corporate sector that's worth investigating. It's not the sole or main reason, but it is a relevant one. And so when policymakers are looking at how to respond, they should have this all of the above approach in mind because there's a lot of ways to interject. It's not just one thing. Okay, so let me break this down into like, a, I got a donut shop and um, I was working my donut shop and then all of a sudden COVID hit and I, I closed the donut shop because I'm not a, you know, uh, I just don't feel comfortable bringing my people in uh, uh, for the donut shop. And I had five bakers. And uh, then uh, people get vaccinated and I got more people coming in for donuts. Scenario one, where it is a, um, where it is an increase in demand is that like, people are psyched to finally get donuts. And so where I used to sell a hundred donuts a week. I'm now selling 125 uh, donuts a week. And so I jack up my prices a little bit because there's a lot of demand for donuts. And so I'm going to increase my demand. That's, that's the demand side. The supply side is um, it could be um, either. I, I can't get flour the way I, I used to get a special flour and uh, it's, it's at the docks. And so I don't get as much and I got to pay more to get that flour in my store. But it also may be that like I fired my five bakers and I can only rehire three because I just can't, the other two, they went, and, uh, you know, they moved to uh, whatever it is to the beach and they're, you know, they're working uh, as, you know, uh, they're renting condos or whatever they're doing. And so I have three bakers. And so, it is a constraint on my supply, both in terms of labor or, uh, you know, dough. And, the, and, the, and the, the third story is just like, there's nobody else selling donuts around here. And it's the same amount of people coming in and I got more or less the same supply costs and labor, but like, everybody's talking about inflation. I can jack up my prices a little bit and just go like, you know, it's, it's inflation and, and that's it. Now, those are the three scenarios, right? Yep, that's exactly right. Okay, so what, if that is the case, like what is, when we see the Fed raising uh, interest rates, what are they, like in the way that they're doing, which of those three scenarios are they focused on? They're focused on the first one. They're focused on the idea that people are spending too much money, so they want to bring the level of spending down. Um, and they can, and, um, in the through a lot of different channels uh and there's a question about how effective they are how long they take how variable they are um but the idea is that they're going to have people spend less money either they're make it more attractive to save money um they're going to make it so that uh, a lot of businesses are investing less that that people feel less wealthy because the stock market tanked as it has so far this year uh and so that their wealth feels lower so they're going to spend less out of wealth um, that, you know, the, the banking system is going to maybe lend less credit and hopefully nobody's actually taking out loans to buy your donuts, no matter how good they are. But in general, in the economy, loans are financing a lot of economic activity. Um, but that demand channel, that, that sense of like people are spending too much money in the economy relative to what we can produce is what they envision themselves doing. And it's the most logical way in which those tools work. Now, now but if, all of a sudden it becomes more expensive for me to buy a car because they're, they're increasing the loan, uh, the, the, the cost of the loan to buy the car, uh, or buy a house. And if they're increasing the cost to buy a house, it's going to, um, and, 
and we're already starting to see this in the housing market, right? People are buying less houses, which ends up jacking up the cost of rent. Because if people are buying less houses, then they're building less houses. And we have a building, uh, we have a housing shortage. And to the extent that we had, you know, uh, houses out there, a lot of like these uh, investment firms bought up a lot of stuff, in, in, you know, 10 years ago in the wake of the financial crisis. And so ostensibly they're doing this because inflation's hurting me, but it's their remedy is also hurting me. Who's their remedy benefiting? Like who, like what's the real story? Mike? Like, like, are they really concerned about, um, you know, Jane Doe on the street being able to afford stuff? And if, if so, like, wait, what you're making stuff more expensive so that I don't buy it so that it's things are going to get to an equilibrium. What's going on? I mean, that's how they envision it. Right. And so, um, you know, people are worried about inflation. It does have a, a cost on people, but, they have the Fed has a very limited toolkit. I mean, this is like their one hammer, uh, and it does one thing very bluntly across the economy. It is not nimble or targeted. Uh, it can't address sector specific issues. Um, it does have a lot of collateral damage. One way it works is by getting people to spend less, but one way you get people to spend less is by essentially lowering the rate of wage growth. Um, and you know, if people have less money, then they're spending less money. But then if they have less money, they're more insecure. Then if they default on something, then there's all kinds of other problems then that, that percolate throughout the economy. So there's, um, it's not a great tool. I don't think it's the tool we necessarily would have set up in, in, in the blank, but it's the one that they have right now. And it's the one that they're choosing to use most notably. And this is because um, uh, our, our lawmakers can't do anything, supposedly, because... Um... Because, you know, Joe Manchin, uh, you know, uh, uh, won't go on board for anything in terms of uh, that uh, is proposed on one hand. And on the other hand, you need 60 in the Senate. So what 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 tools what do you suggest? Like, what would we do if we were more sane? So there are certain types of ways of cutting demand that I think are um, beneficial for the economy as a whole, like prescription drug prices. Um you know, more general healthcare price controls, the kinds that might have with you know, single payer, all rate, all payer rates hitting. Um, you know, that's not all that's going to happen right now, but prescription drug price control could pass. I mean, it seems like they have 58 or, or I'm sorry, 48 or 49 votes at least in the Senate for it, and it could go through reconciliation. And that would take a, a chunk out of inflation in, in the short run in an important way, right? In a way that I think we want to see anyway. Um, there's ways to innovate more housing being built and constructed. Um, a lot of ways, you know, Build Back Better had a huge part of, of um, a huge housing bill that had ways of increasing both the supply and the demand of housing, ways that were targeted, nimble and smart that would increase the overall housing stock. Um, you know, there's other things like investments in infrastructure. Um, you know, right now getting energy under control, I think would be the most important for everyday people. Um, you know, energy prices are going to kind of come and go in the medium term. But right now, people are really feeling that pinch for good reason. So and ways to increase the supply, ideally, of green energy, while also curtailing the demand, say, by encouraging people from working to work from home. Um, you know, there's no silver bullet here. Um, but, you know, the sense the sense that I get from policymakers, even in the Biden administration, is this extra level of doom and gloom that there's just nothing they can do. So they just hope Jay Powell, the Federal Reserve Chair, can solve it for them, I think is ultimately going to backfire for them. Because I think Powell himself notes that, you know, the tools are limited and blunt and likely to have a lot of collateral damage. So anything else that can help take the pressure off of it. And there's a lot of good ideas in Build Back Better, a lot of good ideas uh, administratively that the Biden administration can do on its own, I think would make a, make a difference and, and every little bit would help here. Right. And if that, uh, if you did marginal things, uh, in terms of executive action, let's say, and we're able to do marginally, uh, well, cause there's going to be a reconciliation bill. It's just a question of what mansion will sign off on. Um, you would diminish the pressure on the fed to use their blunt instrument, which could cause a recession, um, uh, in, in, in service of, of inflation. Well, uh, Mike Konzel, um, thank you so much for walking us through this, uh, because I think a lot of people, including myself, have been confused about it, and I really appreciate uh, the time. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Thanks. All right, folks, um, we're going to uh, – do we need to take a quick break? We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll be talking to Amani Badhaso. She's a candidate for Congress in Minnesota's 4th District. Right back after this.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. I want to welcome to the program uh, Amani Badhaso. She's a candidate for Congress in Minnesota's 4th District. Um, running in a primary against uh, Betsy McCollum, uh, a longtime uh, uh, congresswoman from that uh, district. Amani, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me, Sam, and everyone else. Thank you. So, all right, let's start with just tell us a little bit about the 4th District, and uh, and then we'll get into, you know, uh, why you're running in this primary. Yeah, absolutely. So the 4th District um, is Ramsey County and some parts of Washington County, but majority of it is Ramsey, St. Paul. It is a Democratic district, Democratic majority, in fact, progressive majority, because we supported uh, Bernie Sanders overwhelmingly in 2016 and 2020. And, you know, it's majority working class. I, for example, live on um, on the east side of St. Paul, which is majority working class. We have over 40% uh, folks of color in this district. And it is also home to the largest majority of former refugees in the state of Minnesota, right next to the, the fifth district where Representative Omar is. And so I feel incredibly honored because this was the place that gave me a home when I was 13 years old, when I uh, moved here as a refugee. Okay, and so let's um, uh, get into this. It, this is an interesting race because it uh, pits ostensibly two uh, people. And, and again, th there's really no chance of a Republican winning this seat. So um, this just becomes a question of, you know, what is the nature of the representation you want from a district that went for Bernie Sanders, say? Um, and... Um, on paper, you and McCollum have, it appears, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but on paper, it appears like you have very similar uh, positions ideologically. Um, is, is, that, is that a fair assessment? You have a working class organizer, a former refugee from one of the poorest nations in the world, running against the CFO of the military industrial complex. I am a grassroots uh, funded candidate, 100% of uh, my donation comes uh, you know, from working class folks. Majority of my donations have been from District 4. We were able to out fundraise a 22 year incumbent as a result of folks wanting change. Uh, she is a, a corporate Democrat and I am a people funded grassroots candidate. So there couldn't be more distinction, but of course, um, you know, she's a Democrat and I'm a Democrat as well. Certainly, uh, we have a lot more in common than than we disagree. But I do believe that my district deserves uh, somebody that will be accountable to them and not to Lockheed Martin and Raytheon. Uh, I think they're ready to welcome a new generation of leadership. I mean, that is I mean, that's I mean, I mean, broadly speaking, that it, there is a problem with uh, in uh, with with people who chair uh, like armed services committees, right? I mean, like, I mean, in, in, there's a certain inevitability that that person um, is, is, is going to be getting a lot of their money from the same people who are getting their money from that committee, essentially. Um, how, how, let me, let me just, and this is a little bit off topic from the, but how, how do we deal with that? I mean, if we are, are, uh, you know, uh, and and I think you're 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 one of those people who who feel like we should have a much smaller military budget, um, not necessarily because we need that money in other places. I'm quite convinced that we could find that money if we wanted to, but that it creates things like wealth uh, disparity. It creates things like death and destruction for other people around the world. It um, it gives that industry an extraordinary amount of power because of the way that, you know, that money is dispersed throughout the country and, and influences uh, politicians there. From a, from a perspective of progressives who want to limit the military industrial complex, like, like what do you do about that type of situation? Because on one hand, you get a progressive in there, they would have to not take that kind of money, right? I mean, to be able to basically constrain that committee. Yeah, absolutely. So we have broader issues across the states, right? I first want to say that I consider myself a product of, uh, you know, the folks who continuously fund um, U.S. imperialism abroad. I flew uh, from war and conflict, uh, grew up without both parents as a result, and lived in 
in the slums of Nairobi, Kenya, basically starving majority of my life. Um, I do believe that money in our politics is a major issue, uh, but there's a broader issue of the military industrial complex that dictates the legislative policies in Washington. As you know, recently, we are always um, able to fund uh, the, the military and the Pentagon billions in access of what they ask for. Uh, my opponent, for example, Betty McCollum, who is a self claimed uh, progressive has voted to increase the defense budget 22 times. Mind you, they're giving $30 billion more than they asked. Um, and I think that has much to do with, you know, serving the defense contractors that fund them. So if you're going to have uh, the, the likes of Lockheed Martin and Raytheon funding you, of course, you're going to increase their budget. Of course, you're going to be there to serve them. But the folks in my district, as I mentioned to you, many of us refugees, many of us immigrants, many of us who have lived paycheck to paycheck, um, continuously work two or three jobs just to be able to make ends meet. We deserve a representative that's willing to fight on our behalf, not Lockheed Martin or Raytheon. And I think that's the argument we're making here in the fourth district. What we're saying is this is a, this is a progressive district. Folks want um, you know, access to a living wage. Folks want somebody who's gonna show up, host town halls and forums. Folks want Medicare for all, they want the Green New Deal, and they want to basically not send somebody to Washington who's gonna be a lobbyist on behalf of the corporations that fund them. And I think that's the argument we're making here. But with regards to the military industrial complex, um, I think it requires us to have a backbone, right? Both the voter and also folks in government to actually come to a reality that we shouldn't be funding uh, wars and weapons. We should be investing in our communities. We should be funding schools, right? I think it's misplaced priority. And I think certainly status quo politicians are, are the reason why we are in the position that we are, which is why we need a new wave. We need a new wave of progressives uh, who have you know, the, the courage to step up and run. It's not an easy endeavor, certainly. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, um, when I, when I look at someone like McCollum, who is a co-sponsor of Medicare for all, uh, and again, on paper, this looks good at the same time, um, you don't get to be head of the armed services committee unless you have a very transactional and probably a very, um, a smoothly transactional relationship with the leadership of the party in the house who are not in favor of Medicare for all. And it sort of um, r raises the question for me, like, you know, what's, I, I can see what the get is. What's the give um, in, that, in that dynamic? And that's a little bit uh, uh, problematic. And, and so do you think that generationally there is a different style? I mean, I uh, maybe talk too much about, about the, there, there being a generational problem within the Democratic Party, both in terms of like their politics within the Democratic Party and also relative to the Republican Party. So I think the establishment knows that we're always going to vote blue, right, regardless of whether they move on important legislation or not. I think that's uh, that's another problem that we have to address. But, you know, my opponent signed on Medicare for all, but takes a lot of money from private health insurance. Right. Um, this year was the only year in the past several years that I've heard her talk about Medicare for all, because now there's a tough, uh, tough challenge to, to her leadership. Uh, but I think, honestly, the main reason why we are saying that we want folks who are accountable to people in the district who are not taking any money from big pharma, fossil fuel industries, big oil, et cetera, no corporate PACs, right, is because we know money has tremendous influence. You can sign on a piece of uh, resolution or legislation, but it's how hard you fight for that, right? Especially when you're in a position to actually make a difference, especially when you're the darling of the establishment, right? And in a, in a safe democratic district. Um, and so for me, it's, it's, it's more than just paying lip service to the issue. Uh, occasionally when you're, when you're challenged by a working class organizer, it's about how hard are you willing to fight for Medicare for all? And we don't have it quite frankly, to be very honest with you, because we have the establishment that caters more to the corporations than to us, than to working class people. Um, and I should say, uh, I've been corrected, um, that McCollum is the chair of the Defense Subcommittee on the Appropriations Committee, which is, I mean, it, it is as it sounds. That's, that's where you, it's basically the spigot um, of where the dollars flow. Um, mm -hmm. But you mentioned, you know, the idea of, of, of the Democrats understanding that, uh, and, and assuming, and, and, and I, I think it's a safe assumption, and I certainly uh, operate in this way, that um, 
way more often than not, we're going to end up voting, uh, pulling the lever for the Democrat because particularly, I mean, in nearly every district in the country, it seems to me, um, the Democrat is going to be less bad than the Republican. In some instances, they'll be good. But the, in terms of that baseline, you know, so what do you, what do you, do you, I guess I should put it this way. Do you see electing people like yourself who are, uh, whose funding does not come from corporate interests, who, um, uh, who are, well, you know, come from an organizing background as the key to dealing with that issue, particularly in a district where it's not going to go Republican? Like, I mean, my, my theory has always been like in districts like that, we need the furthest most left, both in terms of ideology, but also in approach um, uh, that we can get. Absolutely. So, Sam, I'll tell you just a little bit more about my candidacy. So first quarter, I'll fundraise a 22 year incumbent. We uh, churned out over 2000 newcomers into the caucus and convention process in my state, which is sort of this elitist. A party operative only process. And we're close to actually winning until disenfranchisement efforts took place because they were shocked that um, a new political comer could, could accomplish as much as we have been able uh, to do. I, you know, the main reason why we talk about grassroots funded candidates is we're not going to be there to, to appease or, or to work uh, for um, the leadership. We're going to be there to work on behalf of working class families. We're not going to be there to work on behalf of big oil or big pharma, right? We don't have that sort of uh, established status quo. I'm here to serve you up until I get that chairmanship or chairwomanship. We can have actually somebody that's going to boldly organize and fight for Medicare for all, because we know that 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 tough fight is not going to happen overnight, right? But the more of us there are part of the Progressive Caucus, by the way, my opponent um, is not a member of the Progressive Caucus, where we can actually prioritize important legislative policies and fight on behalf of working class families. What's the point of a Democratic Party that continues to sell out to the corporate PACs or to the defense industry or special interests? It makes no sense for me. And so I think my folks are ready. They've been ready when they voted for Bernie Sanders during the presidential election. And I think they, they are ready today because you wouldn't see uh, this race as one of the most challenging races in the state of Minnesota against a 22 year incumbent. If folks were like, we are tired of the same status quo politicians who occasionally show up once a year to take photos, but are doing nothing to actually fight for poor working class folks across our district. And, and we should also say, it seems to me, and, and maybe you'd have a better sense of this, Minnesota is, um, is, a, is a purple state. I mean, it is, it's, it's blue, but it's purple. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of having candidates who are, um, who are more tied to the community, who are bringing out new voters, this adds value to the top of the ticket because— when we talk about Wisconsin or Pennsylvania or we talk about Arizona or um, uh, uh, or, or Michigan and, and maybe Minnesota, we're talking about thousands of people. We're not talking about tens and we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of people. We're talking maybe about thousands or tens of thousands most that are going to make the difference in these presidential elections and senatorial elections and for any given district to bring out a new percentage of voters has value to even like the mainstream, even your, you know, even those people who are even the establishment Democrats, it seems to me. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a race, uh, basically establishment versus folks wanting somebody that will work on their behalf. Um, you know, we have a tough um, statewide race um, with Governor Tim Waltz being on the ballot. And he's certainly going to need all the folks that we've been able to turn out. If you look at CD5, uh, you know, they're represented by a courageous Congresswoman um, Ilhan Omar. Their turnout is huge. They're actually one of the main reasons why we're able to hold statewide um, as, as Democrats. And so you have an opportunity in District 4 where there's extremely low turnout, no engagement of, di of diverse coalition. Um, and you get a chance to actually have somebody that's going to mobilize the community, that's going to be in the community. And yeah, it's really unfortunate what the establishment um, was was able to do here in attempts to disenfranchise um, newcomers because they felt as though 
you know, uh, the congresswoman would be losing the endorsement. But I will say, you know, we're going to continue to expand the electorate. We're going to continue to have some tough conversations. You know, majority of my work um, for the past like 14 years has been hearing from folks about the absence of their congresswoman, about how they don't know what she actually does, but they know she has some huge title. But for them, for the small businesses that have closed down across the east side, across the west side, they need somebody that's going to fight on their behalf. And Betty McCollum just isn't it. I'll be very frank and honest with you. Uh, we have heard time and time again that she's going to deliver on, on Medicare for all, uh, that she's going to deliver on uh, the Green New Deal while taking money from the folks that want to ensure that it doesn't uh, go anywhere, really. And so we we deserve better than empty lip service. Um, and what we will do this August is actually send a message uh, to the establishment um, what happens when you completely ignore uh, the large base of your, uh, the large progressive base of our community. I, I think it's going to be a really tough fight. And I think, you know, regardless of whether we are going to show up in mass numbers to, to elect a Democrat in November, we want to see change. We want to see less corporate Democrats in office and more progressives and more folks who are willing to fight on behalf of working class families. And certainly, as you know, we make no apologies for that fight. Um, you, uh, one last question. You brought up uh, Ilhan Omar, and I know that she is, um, uh, if, if she hasn't, I don't know if she's done a uh, an official endorsement, but uh, certainly has uh, expressed uh, admiration for your candidacy. Um, one of the things that uh, the she and other members of the squad are uh, are known for is to have a more critical perspective on the U.S. relationship with Israel. Uh, McCollum has also had a, uh, a history of, uh, I think, um, uh, fairly, um, uh, you know, from the perspective of people who um, have been skeptical of that relationship or the way that it works, um, have been pretty good. What, what is your position on, on uh, U.S. relationship with Israel? Yeah, so I'm a former refugee who flew away from discrimination and, and war and violence. And so I stand in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle for freedom. And certainly, uh, you know, want to ensure that uh, the Israeli people are also able to leave, uh, live in peace and security. I think we have to always reevaluate our relationships with allies that commit gross human rights violations. And so for me, as a progressive and as somebody who knows what it's like to, you know, live through conflict, it's really critical that we are able to uphold our own values, right? We certainly don't do that enough. Uh, and we haven't. But I think as a progressive, um, as somebody who uh, comes uh, from a completely different country, I will be committed to standing up for the things that I believe that we should be standing up for, which is for democracy, for human rights, and to ensure all of our allies live up to those standards. And if they don't, I think uh, it's going to be a tough, a tough um, position to be in, to be uh, continuously in relationship with folks who commit gross human rights violations. Well, uh, Amani Badhasa, um, uh, candidate for Congress in Minnesota's 4th District. Uh, do you have a website? I do. Uh, so, I figured as much. <laughs> so for folks who share our vision, uh, for folks uh, who want to actually have more uh, progressives who are accountable to people in U.S. Congress, go to amaneforcongress.com. So it's A-M-A-N-E for congress.com. And feel free to sign up and, and get activated and get involved because it's going to take all of us uh, to, to ensure that we're able to uh, to fight for each other. So and I when urge and when is this primary taking place? August 9th. So very soon. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, really appreciate you coming on. We will put a link to your site at uh, majority.fm and in the podcast. Thank you so much, Sam. I'm a huge fan, so I'm honored oh. to be here. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Have a great day. Right. Bye, everyone. All right, folks. Time to head into the fun half of the program, where, because it is Thursday, I will have the rare pleasure of, oh, wow. of joining it's going to the be kids table it's uh it's going to be uh, a sausage factory around here <laughs> i like sausage fest more than factory uh, but sausage, factory. sausage fest where is uh where is binder uh, i guess he's not uh um, and you didn't hear i will say you go Brandon? to uh, amani's uh money for congress.com there's a great image of the mississippi river which i miss so Nice. Oh, there you go. The old uh, taken in by the uh, river shot. Yep. Uh, uh, I bring Brandon, Brandon Sutton. In? Yeah, sure. Let's uh, let's bring everybody in. We'll do our uh, little uh, our plugs. Oh, I you know what? I, I didn't. 
you know, that's the thing. I forget sometimes I can see the preview. Brandon. Hello. How are you? I'm doing all right. Did someone mention sausage? I could I could go for a bite. I could eat. Well, there you go. Uh, you missed earlier my uh, donut analogy, which which I realized as soon as I started talking about donuts, I was going to make myself hungry. So you, that was a big mistake. I have a hard time finding a good donut, even though I live in New York City. It's, it's you know, this is Biden's America. Or <laughs> Is it really a, a donut deficiency? We're, are we trying to get Bender in? Um, it's, it's confused because you're here instead of Emma. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> we're already getting IMs. Uh, we, we're already getting IMs about, like, who's this sub host? Sub as in, like, substitute and sub in, in terms of quality. Really bringing down the uh, quality of the Thursday show. Uh, Brandon, what, why don't you tell us uh, what, uh, why don't you uh, plug your uh, show? What's, ha what's happening on yours? Absolutely. Uh, we put out an episode, I want to say last week regarding, you know, our thoughts on the epidemic of gun violence in America, as well as the January 6th committee uh, hearings took last week off for Juneteenth, as is my right, as is my obligation. And, you know, this week we'll have another episode out, you know, chopping it up about what we missed. So, I mean, hopefully people are interested in learning about crypto because that's what I spent the last few weeks of my life learning about crypto more more crashes more dips as the kids are saying so you know exciting stuff coming up i was gonna say um tough time to get into the crypto biz um although you know they say buy low <laughs> you can ask <laughs> Matt Pinder about that <laughs> anyways folks can check out the discourse where where can you where can you check out the discourse like uh, you can... on, uh, your podcast servers yeah, you can primarily find uh, new episodes out on our Patreon, uh, patreon.com backslash expand the discourse. You can find some of our older catalog, uh, pre-pandemic catalog uh, on SoundCloud at uh, soundcloud.com backslash expanded discourse and all of your like podcasting platforms. They let us on those, surprisingly. You know? it, is, it is shocking. It is shocking. Um, Matt Binder. Hello. How are you? I'm well. Nice to see you. I think this is the first time I've seen you since uh, you spent time with Tim Pool. Um, yes, it is. Yeah. And uh, so I see you're still doing uh, well. You haven't contracted any, <laughs> any uh, <laughs> another round of COVID uh, from uh, visiting him, um, and um, sat in the very seat that um, that Dennis Prager sat in, right? <laughs> saying that uh, you can't find any leftists to uh, debate. I know right. it smelled crazy in there. <laughs> <laughs> um how is uh, uh, uh what do you got on doomed uh this week sure well speaking or of, or, or the uh, or uh the scammer scam economy yeah I, scam I do economy. i do i do both every week uh on tuesday i did an all call-in show because ever since going on tim pool show i've been receiving uh more listener calls than ever before and uh this past tuesday i had a very interesting call from Someone who, uh, and this involves you, Sam, uh, a listener uh, named Brian from Alabama called into the show and told me how basically uh, he was apolitical, not involved with politics, got into, got interested with what was going on in the world during uh, the, the COVID pandemic. And he fell down a conspiracy theory rabbit hole and was listening to people like David Icke and some really hardcore, like even like anti-Semitic conspiracy theorists. And then from there, he discovered Jimmy Dore, and he was a Jimmy Dore fan for a bit, and then he stumbled upon your debate with Jimmy Dore from 2016. And he told me that started to chip away at everything, and now he's a full on board, whole majority report listener and fan, big fan of yours, listens to my show now. So that debate you did with Jimmy Dore, just how many, geez, that's like five or six years ago now. Yeah. Uh, we should re-put that out. You know, we should we should, should rewatch it. Just we should, we should rewatch yeah. it. But I want you know because the when we clipped it at the time. Now, Matt, were you there at that time? I wasn't. No. That no, was okay. right after right. I it was left. Right after yeah. you left. And the way that went down was I had contacted, and none of this is in the context of the debate because I think the way that we clipped the debate, we didn't see this part. But I had called Jimmy, or I had emailed Jimmy the night before and said, "Look." You know, because I, I perceive, you know, I didn't, I didn't follow his stuff too much, but I perceived him as largely we were on the same uh, sort of side of things. But I had seen this clip of him, 
you know, on his uh, aggressive progressive show, I think it was called, you know, saying like Peter Thiel becomes a Supreme Court doesn't matter. And, uh, it, you know, what difference does it make? And, uh, you know, people were saying the Supreme Court's a big deal. It's not a big deal. And I, I, I sent him an email. I said, hey, do you want to come on the show tomorrow? Because I'm going to talk about this. Um, and, you know, I don't want to I don't want to, you know, criticize you in your absence, um, which is the way that like way back then, seven, you know, eight years ago, I guess this was six years ago. Um, you know, we had some decorum in this business. I mean, Michael and was now, going on Jimmy's show before that. Like, yeah, it was like he was just part of the uh, crew. Yeah. And um, and and there was just some de- decorum like, you know, you would you would you would. You weren't, you know, it wasn't like a gotcha situation. And he said, no, no, I don't, I'm not, I, I can't, I can't do it. Um, I can't remember exactly the words he used. I can't do it. But he said, I do remember him saying, rip me a new one. And I'm like, uh, all right. And, um, and then he must have been listening to the show. He must have been tuning in and he called in. So I started on it and he called in. And so I don't even think the clip that I was referencing is in the debate video maybe we should reissue that video with the de- with the clip um so that people could see it and then and then the rest is history and all i i remember is uh uh michael brooks you know i aming me going like don't take the headshot and i was just like, mm, mm, like this. I, I still that. can't believe to this day that his most fantastical scenario the one that he said would be equivalent to the equivalent to the moon falling into lake michigan uh happened it was, it yeah, it was, was absolutely most... imminently foreseeable too. <laughs> and, and, the, and the thing is too is that I think it gets lost in this is that he was claiming that the Democrats had well there was two things he was claiming. He was claiming a that the Democrats, if they lost the Senate, would have the ability to stop Trump from appointing somebody and he didn't seem to understand that the reason why McConnell was able to stop Obama from appointing Garland was because they controlled the Senate. And then the other thing that was weird about it was I was the one who was saying, and you can't trust Democrats in the Senate exactly, to have yeah. any backbone. Like, this is just the reality we deal with. And, I, you know, if I could wave a wand and have a better party called the whatever it is, you know, the, you know, the rinky dink party and they come in and they actually function the way I want them to. That would be great. But the fact is, you can't. You have to look at the politics that exist and try and like, you know, how do you for there's some room to force some politicians. There's some you have to avoid. There's some that you have to work around. And there's some you have to just realize, like, they exist. You know, I can't like it's not weakness to carry an umbrella when it's raining and by as as opposed to sitting there and demanding it stop raining. It's going to rain. And so you, you go and you mitigate whatever that situation is. Um, that was not the point of my asking you about uh, t- uh, Tim Pool. Right. Well, yeah, anyway. it just it came up because uh, that's someone who called in who discovered the show. Uh, I don't think it was via Tim Pool, but, uh, you know, he, he found you before. And I think, you know, I've heard from people who have said, like, you know, shows like yours and, and um, you know, obviously yours as well. I've heard people say this sort of stuff is that combated the other right-wing uh internet personalities and pundits and help them uh come out the other side and i think you know that's that's great to hear um also then tonight 9 p.m that was that's doomed i did that on tuesday you can check that out youtube.com slash matt binder and doomthecast.com and then tonight same place on youtube youtube.com slash matt binder and at scameconomy.com for the podcast 9 p.m eastern time i talk with uh mike burgersberg who has been uh, reporting and investigating this big crypto lending firm called Celsius, which people might be familiar with their name because they are that second shoe to drop after what happened with Terra and Luna a couple of weeks ago. They're that second shoe to drop that caused that like second big crypto crash that came directly after. Uh, as of right now, uh, there's like 500,000 customers who had funds with Celsius that can't withdraw their money. Uh, so uh, we dive into uh, what's yeah whoops, and uh, we dive into what's going on there and uh, the the interesting uh, somewhat shady past of their uh, founder as well. I find all of that hard to believe. Right. 
all of that. Um, Matt, what's happening in the Matt Leckian media universe? Uh, yeah, last night we had a, a talk uh, both with Chip Givens on Julian Assange and uh, Jean Bajelon on Sublation Media. So uh, full free, like three hours of uh, Left Reckoning last night on Twitch and uh, YouTube. Patreon.com says Left Reckoning uh, to support us. All right, we're going to take a quick break and head into the fun half, wherein we will take your phone calls and your IMs um, and uh, talk about some funny videos that we found. <laughs> and also, uh, I want to talk about January 6th. Uh, we'll be right back after this. Three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, and I don't think it's going to be the same as it looks like in six months from now, and I don't know if it's necessarily going to be better six months from now than it is three months from now. But I think around 18 months out, we're going to look back and go like, wow. What? What is that going on? It's nuts. Wait a second. Hold on. For, hold on for a second. The majority Emma, welcome to the program. Hey. Fun. Matt. You. Fun. What is up, everyone? Fun. No, me key. You did it. Fun. Let's go, Brandon. Let's go, Brandon. Bradley, you want to say hello? Uh, sorry to disappoint everyone. I'm just a random guy. It's all the boys today. Fundamentally false. No, I'm sorry. Women's... Stop talking oh, wow. for a second. Now let me finish. Where is this coming from, dude? But, but dude, uh, you want to smoke this... Um, seven, eight? Yes. Yes. Is it me? Is it me? It is you. Is it me? Hello, is it me? I think it is you. Who is you? Oh, no sound. Every single freaking day. What's on your mind? Sports. We can discuss free markets and we can discuss capitalism. Oh, I'm going to go that way. Libertarians. They're so stupid, though. Common sense says, of course. Gobbledygook. We fucking did. So, what's 79 plus 21? Challenge map. I'm positively quivering. I believe 96, I want to say. 857 210 35 501 one half. 38 911, for instance. $3,400. $1,900. 543 trillion dollars sold. It's a zero sum game. Actually, you're making me think less. But, but let me say this. Poop. <laughs> you call it satire. Sam goes to satire. <laughs> On top of it all? Yeah. My favorite part about yeah. you is just like every day, all day, yeah. like everything you do. Without a doubt. Hey, buddy, we see you. <laughs> all right, folks, folks, folks. It's just the week being weeded out, obviously. Yeah, sun's out, guns out. I, I, I don't know. But you should know. People the, the, just don't like to entertain ideas anymore. I have a question. Who cares? Our chat is enabled, wow. folks. I love it. I do love that. Uh, uh, the, the, Look, um, gotta jump. You gotta be quick. I gotta jump. I'm losing it, bro. <laughs> um, Two o'clock. We're already late, and the guy's being a dick. So screw him. Um, um, Sent to a gulag? Outrageous. Like, what is wrong with you? Love you, bye. Love you. Bye-bye. Take your calls. Um, and we uh, generally have fun. Right? Is that what happens? We try. Yeah. I would say we try. All right. We try to have fun. It happens. Why not? What's going on? Do we have a problem? I mean, it depends. Do we? No, I didn't mean with you guys. I meant with the tech, <laughs> the tech guys. Um, yeah. So we accidentally ended the, um, uh, the fun half stream. So we're just going to go with the normal stream today. So everybody... So everybody just stay on the stream today, the normal stream. No fun half, uh, no fun half stream today. Okay, sorry. Um, 
this is what happened when Emma's gone. We just go off the rails immediately. Yeah, no, everything is everything is falling apart. Um, let's. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the January sixth hearings. The the uh, we what do we know? Hearing five. Is this going to be hearing five today at three p.m. Just following the show, we asked them to see if they could push it back a little bit instead of competing with us uh, during when we were broadcasting, and uh, they agreed. Of course, that was all. Um, that was all a uh, sort of payback for my uh, shilling on behalf of Nancy Pelosi. Got the uh, Democratic establishment to uh, to hold the congressional hearings a little bit later. Anyways, um, well, I I want both your takes on on these hearings so far because um, I was more skeptical. And and frankly, I think more dismissive of some of this stuff even two weeks ago uh, than I am today. I'm curious. Uh, let's Brandon, let's start with you. What's your perspective on these? I mean, I think a lot is coming out that we sort of suspected, you know, was true. And I know there's been a lot of, I don't know, pushback against even having these kinds of uh, hearings on the January 6th uh, insurrection, riot, whatever people call it. But from my standpoint, I think that watching Democrats use, you know, the public platform to harass the Republicans who are prone to their kinds of public meltdowns and are especially used to not having to defend themselves on these sorts of, you know, if they say it like, you know, uh, anti-state schemes they get involved in that you know the more people are exposed to the truth of the republican party the more we can chip away from this sort of a myth that they're allowed to propagate that they are responsible stewards of 50 percent of our populations like votes you know they're a fringe party and they should be framed as such in these hearings and the, like the newest evidence um or rather, just the entire body of it, uh, ranging from what we saw on the first day when it came to, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little uh, flustered uh, thinking about, I haven't talked about the hearings uh, in specific, as specificity since it first happened, but, you know, I think seeing the direct interactions that a lot of the Republican lawmakers have had with the rioters, you know, giving tours, doing that kind of thing has really done a number on them and put them on the back foot. So that's a good. Um, Matt, what's your, what's your sense of it? Yeah, I mean, I was I was skeptical as well at, at first, and I still sort of still have the uh, that that uh, critique of they should absolutely be directly suggesting that there are charges brought to certain people, which you know they said they are not going to do. Um, but you know, because I, I I also still kind of feel like you know if if there are no consequences to some of, I mean, we've seen like the low level pawns, like the people who were convinced to go down there and some low level and maybe even some high level proud boy guys and, and uh, you know, the, the like, but we haven't seen like the people in the Trump administration and the Trump family themselves, uh, even some of the higher level, like oath keeper and proud boy types who were like directly plotting with the Trump cabinet. Um, we haven't really seen them face any real uh, consequences from this yet. And I sort of worry that, if this all ends and it doesn't result in anything, then people will just people who aren't so plugged in might just think, oh, they went through with all this and they they didn't find anything to charge them with. I guess they didn't do anything. Um, but at the same time, I have been seeing uh, people say like, you know, oh, my Republican father or uncle or grandfather uh, caught a part of it. And now they're tuning in every day and they're like right. questioning certain things, which is certainly interesting. Like that, that's certainly uh, good if it's pulling some people out of the idea that the election was actually stolen from Donald Trump or that he uh, didn't try to do anything to overturn the election or was actually Antifa. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I also think that um, – uh, some of the stuff that I, I assumed that would just be like regurgitating stuff I already knew as someone who is very plugged into what happened. Um, I, I was I'm surprised to see some of the video footage they were able to get their hands on that hasn't been released yet. Like, yep. you know, in this day and age, you think there would be at some point some of this stuff would have leaked out from the original sources. But they, they got stuff that wasn't priorly uh, seen. I don't think there was anything like too shocking or new in terms of the content, but to see it, I think, helps like to see things that we weren't able to see before. It certainly helps. What, what's interesting to, to, to me is um, is the um, is that and, and I agree with you in terms of the accountability. That's really important. Um, there is some like sort of hints that the DOJ is starting to do stuff. And there is some hints that they have been waiting because we have to remember these hearings are over November 
sixth, or or I I should say January twentieth of next year. The, the Democrats are are more than likely going to lose the House. I think it's conceivable they could keep the Senate, but they're they're more than likely going to lose the House. So the, there is a clock on these hearings, um, you know, and so, but there's no clock on the DOJ, or at least it's not for another two years. And so the the sequencing makes some sense. And you're starting to see the DOJ subpoena today. I think it was yesterday it was announced they're subpoenaing the um, chair of the uh, of the Republican Party in Georgia. Uh, the FBI is investigating uh, the phones of a, um, uh, a Republican election official in in Nevada. And the thing that I find um, that that has been interesting to me about these hearings is um, I always suspected that the the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and some of this information had come out that they were the vanguard and they, you know, they knew this was happening and that they were coordinated. And we've yet to see the connection between the the uh, Trump administration and them. But I think that's coming. And the other thing that I think has been surprising to me, though, was just how. They really did have a plan with the fake electors and they had and they they not only had a plan, they had sort of like fallback positions within that plan. This is scenario A, which is optimal for our trying to do this, where Michigan or, uh, you know, uh, Georgia accepts the fake electors because we can convince somebody there to do it. And then once that happens, all bets are off. And if we can't get them to accept it, maybe we can get the, you know, the Senate to say there's a question about the electors. And that's where Ron Johnson, like Ron Johnson should be right now sitting with a defense attorney going like, what do I do? Um, and he might be, I mean, for all we know, because he got nailed in this. He got nailed. He was part of this, an attempt to defraud the U.S. government. Can't make up electors and, 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 and have a senator deliver, like, there's, there's, there's other electors. I've got some information that might, you know, stop this wedding, essentially, type of thing. And... And so I think this is going to be this is this is all like it's meaningful and seeing people uh, seeing the people who were pressured in this situation, ranging from, you know, the the electoral worker, even like the the, the head of the, the Arizona uh, State House, um, I think had some value. And today, which is really important, too. And this is interesting because you. They, they, they were doing a full 360 here. Um, they're going through the story of Jeffrey Clark. And Jeffrey Clark was this sort of like low-level DOJ guy. And when Trump couldn't get the acting um, attorney general at the time, uh, which was, uh, what's his face? Jeff Rosen. Jeff Rosen. He wanted Rosen to say there was corruption in the election because then that adds one more fuel to the fire on who the electors are and they wouldn't do it. And they said, like, we haven't found anything. And this guy, uh, Clark, basically reaches out to Trump and says, I'll do it. And in like, in some ways he's following what Bill Barr did. People forget that Bill Barr sent Donald Trump like a seven page brief on how to fight the Mueller investigation when this dude was just hanging out at home and sent it to, got it to Trump. And that's why Trump hired him. And Clark basically tries to do the same thing. And when they're all in the office together with Trump, Clark, uh, Donahue, who was, I think, um, a Rosen's assistant essentially, or, you know, another uh, like subsidiary official, in the DOJ, and I think it, uh, I think it's Donahue who is also testifying today, and I think, uh, and, and Rosen is too, right? Um, Rosen and Donahue are both today. Yeah. Trump's got Rosen and Donahue in the room with Clark going like, you guys have disappointed me. <clears throat> Maybe I should um, just fire you and, and hire this guy. As the DOJ, as the, this is like in the, in the days running up to January 6th. <laughs> and, uh, 
Donahue and uh, uh, Rosen basically go, well, and he goes, what would you guys do if I did that? <laughs> and they say, we'd resign. And everybody said, and, and they said, like, and we'll take half of the DOJ with us. Like, U.S. attorneys, like, half of them will go. And, he, and, and so Trump was basically like, uh, that, that's probably a, a net negative. Could be a headache. That would be a net negative. <laughs> Maybe we don't need this. And we're, you know, you realize like one or two people away from this situation because it, I, I think it's also clear from uh, the testimony that Pence wanted desperately to do this. He just couldn't find anybody who wasn't saying bad idea. But if he found one person, you know, he had Eastman in his office for four hours on January 5th. Like, why? If you're not going to do this, why are you giving this guy four hours of your time or three hours of your time to make his case? And, and, and Pence's lawyers in there going like, this doesn't make any sense. Right. Right. And Pence is just going, well, tell me more. Tell me more. Yeah. I mean, it's really, I mean, that, that part, the details of with Johnson and Pence and, and this sort of thing is like, that's what gives meaning to the spectacle of violence you see. Right. Like, cause you know, we can't, we don't have to be hypothetical about like, Oh, could this have possibly worked? We know how they planned for it to work and it, and it didn't work. Thank God. But it's interesting now, like Eastman seems to be set up to take a fall. Um, you see a lot of articles saying like Trump's going to throw him under the bus or Politico says his exposure is real. But if his exposure is real, it seems like Pence is, is too. <laughs> like, and that's like the story. That's if if there's going to be a limited hangout, it's going to be, oh, Eastman's the bad guy and like was just, you know, r going rogue. But he he was doing what? Like going rogue. Yeah. <laughs> like going rogue from what? That's the point is that he he the only reason why he's in the White House is because they want to hear his his story. Mm -hmm. This is not like a guy who's already in the White House going rogue. He's a guy, he's a rogue guy going going whatever Straight it is. Invited in. <laughs> yeah, invited <laughs> in. I, I think no, this I... is and 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 you know, the Times had a story that you've got Republicans who are bummed out that they're not on the committee now. And Trump is bumped out on the, the committee because the thing that is absent, like Fox can pretend this is not happening, but what they can't do, which they usually do, is they know what's coming and they begin to create a narrative to fight what's coming. But because they don't have any Republicans on the committee, they can't anticipate what's happening day to day. And there's no talking points because they don't know what they're fighting against. Yeah, like McCarthy like explicitly had John Katko, that congressman from New York, broker the bipartisan deal, then scuttled it. Even though Katko is definitely more of like a moderate and less of an election denier than like Jim Jordan or Jim Banks would have been, there would have been a McCarthy ally on the committee. Katko is bringing yeah. the information. This is coming. Right. You guys do with it as you will. Right. I mean, that's and, and they don't have that now. And so they're flying blind and all they have is, um, you know, trans people bad. Well, and I mean, that's the only oh, answer they have. Well, I mean, I think that's just because, like, leading up to these uh, committee hearings and the televised uh, portions of them, you know, their two main narratives have been nothing happened that day. You know, what you saw in the news was just a peaceful protest. People were just walking through the buildings. Anything that you hear to the contrary is a liberal MSNBC leftist myth. Or, you know, okay, something did happen that day. There was, like, a sort of you know, discreet acts of violence by Oath Keepers or Proud Boys unrelated to the presidency, but there was not some sort of a high-level master plan to actually overturn the election. And I think the committee hearings have done a good job of dispelling both of those things. And the part that we should be focusing on is, you know, the Trump administration in a lot of ways was, a, you know, a time for a lot of Republicans and far-right Democrats to test the boundaries on what they could get away with. You know, test the boundaries in terms of what society and the various institutions that you know, are in charge of maintaining law and order would allow if they just really tried to get away with it. And they got away with a lot of stuff. And right. so, you know, in some ways, we can't be surprised that they tried to pull, you know, both because of the type of people they are, but also because there's a history of Republicans stealing elections in this country and the government sort of just rolling over, you know, maybe in more uh, more subtle ways, but we can't be su surprised that they just tried to go for a Hail Mary. And, you know, they'll try to go for one again, maybe two, three, four election cycles down the line. Who knows? But like Trump, I think, you know, operated as this beta test for a lot of what Republicans want to get done in, you know, maybe one or two election cycles. I, 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 I totally agree. 
I totally agree. Um, what I what what I what what is and my only critique would be that they're still trying to make this about like the Trumpers as oh, opposed yeah. to the Republicans. And and I can understand. I mean, what's interesting is like, for instance, like take this guy Bowers, right? Like. I, I, in a million years, I would have never thought like, oh, I, I, I am sympath- you know, sympathetic may be a little bit too strong of a word, but like that I appreciate his testimony. Let's put it that way, that I think it's helpful and, and useful. Fox, and by Fox, I just mean like the entire right wing um, uh, media enterprise. If they knew that Bowers was going to come up there, which they couldn't know because, you know, with like, you know, if they knew weeks ago, that he was going to come up there, which they couldn't know because they have nobody on the committee. They have no way of accessing that information. There would already, we would see a story here or there. He's a, you know, a rhino or this and that. And we, you know, he would already been made a villain in the context of the Fox news people, but he gets up there and he's like a die in the hard uh, Trumpy guy. And he's talking about, you know, he's talking about how the constitution is God, you know, God given and stuff like this. And uh, but he also told Trump that he couldn't break the law. Like, and, and, and if that if that shit gets played for the you know the right, like they don't have an they don't have an answer for that. And um, I don't know. I, I I just find it interesting. Here is uh, Tim Scott. Here's a perfect example. Here's Tim Scott. I, I don't know if there's a better example of flying blind than this. Like they don't have any type of answers to this and so they're just praying that nobody sees it meanwhile trump is pissed because there's no republicans out there defending him but they they have no way of defending because if they say they watched it they're communicating to people it's worth watching (laughs) and so they say they don't watch it and they can't defend it because they don't they can't reference it and so uh you basically just get this type of thing and it's him and and Han. Ask you about the January 6th hearing. It's obviously ongoing. They're methodically laying out this case, um, primarily aimed at former President Trump uh, and his yes. efforts to overturn the election. Um, this specifically today about talking to state uh, authorities about putting in different electors and decertifying elections in different states. Have you have you learned anything new? Number one, is it troubling to you? Number two, and can you support Donald Trump if he runs for president in 2024? Well, Brett, I have not taken the time to watch the hearings. I feel like the best use of my time is fighting the inflationary effects and looking for ways <laughs> to push back for the American (laughs) consumer. I spent my time talking about the gas prices and ways that we can reduce it. I have not watched the January 6th hearings. I was actually in the Senate when it happened, so I don't need an education on what actually happened. I do think that what we're seeing is made for TV. What you haven't seen is any cross-examination. So we're having people- Pause pause it, pause it, wait a second, wait, how do you know? How do you know you have to see cross examination? Have you not watched cross examination? You either watched it or you didn't watch it. You either know what's going on. I mean, he's too busy talking about inflation with people. Yeah, I just like, yeah, like, can you believe these gas so prices? It, I just, it, and it's been six hours yesterday saying, can you believe these gas prices? I just kept saying it over and yeah. over again. So and I'm like, like, oh, well, should we do the Keystone the Pipeline? Like, that's what, their, that's what their action is on gas prices is to like troll environmentalists. But this is their dilemma. Like, you know, he's critiquing these things. He's given a couple of talking points on how people can sort of ignore. There's no there's no cross-examination of what? I mean, you haven't seen it. You have no idea. And it does feel like, and granted, this is the afternoon, right? They're never going to do this at night on Fox. But it does feel like they're trying to sort of figure out a way of like, how do we, you know, jettison Trump without it making it feel like we're jettisoning Trump? But Because uh, they won't say they're jettisoning Trump. Keep, keep playing for TV. What you haven't seen is any cross-examination. So we're having people lay out stories without having the cross-examination. I think if President Trump is a nominee, of course we support him. Uh, The Republicans (laughs) will always present a better solution to the problems that we are faced with in the marketplace today than the Democrats. And so I look forward to having that contrast this year in November and certainly in 2024 as well. But we need to realize that this made-for-TV January 6th 
week's episode has more to do with diverting the public's attention and less to do with finding the truth. If you're looking for the truth, you got to have cross-examination. <laughs> they should just go with, just to be safe, so they don't make any mistakes like he did, where he clearly has been checking it out and watching. They should just be like, come again? January what? Are there even <laughs> that many days in January? Excuse me? Every day I head. spend... Every day I spend approximately three straight hours saluting the flag. So I don't have time to watch this sort of made for TV <laughs> drama. To be fair, you know, I also called it a made for TV drama, but those can be very compelling. Well, that's you know, the thing is he sees people like, tune in all the time. Yeah. When he starts saying like it's a made for TV thing and it's episode this, I'm like, wait a second. TiVo time. I can, I can stream this. Hold on for a second. This is TV. I think I'll watch some of this. I mean, that's the, the, that's the dilemma they have. There's nobody out there, you know, the, the cross-examination thing, I guess, is the only, um, is the only talking point. And I ga guarantee you, guarantee you, we're going to hear more of that. I, I, can, I can hear the words coming out of Sean Hannity's mouth right now. I'm not watching this, but of course there's no cross-examination anyways, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Uh, we've got bathrooms with uh, trans uh, women, and and that's basically the line. The Navy, the Navy watched a video about pronouns. So right, that's exactly. That is the that that will be it. Um, we're not hearing both sides, Sam. Of course, it's because one side decided to boycott them and not go, but still, that invalidates the entire proceedings. It, tell, it there's no cross examination. No one's allowed. I watch enough Law and Order to know that if you don't have the cross examination, you know, there's no jurisprudence, and so. There's it's over. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Check me. Uh, Rob Gorka on IM says, anyone else out there still calling Dennis Prager's sh live show, 877-243-7776 from 12 to 3 Eastern to request him to debate Sam Cedar? I, I don't know. I don't know. You should Again, challenge his anti-baby stance. Let me just repeat that question. Anyone else out there still calling Dennis Prager's live show, 877-243-7776? from 12 to 3 Eastern. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, here is... Uh, it, the, let's talk about, you know, I mean, today we had uh, a Supreme Court uh, drop uh, a gun law, uh, or I should say strike down a uh, gun restriction law in a New York uh, state. And now um, the 35% of people that the New York state authorities thought didn't have a reason to carry around a gun, a uh, concealed weapon, you know, aside from, uh, you know, the ability to do like sport shooting or, or hunting, they're all going to get a gun now. And then one has to imagine a bunch of other people are going to get guns because there's more people carrying guns. And there's going to be some people who are just like, oh, I didn't even realize I could do that. And now there's no, I don't have to fill out any form uh for that uh, or just can't deny me the permit so um we're gonna have a lot more guns around in new york state and a bunch of other states uh we are still waiting on the roe v wade decision essentially here is uh, sean hannity and ted cruz talking about that decision and they are in full like so overblown uh mode because i think they realize like this is not what the American public wants. It's weird that they can't just say, like, oh, we're ending abortion. Let's all be, like, you know, really enthusiastic about it. They have to say, oh, everyone's just um, overreacting to this. It's not really yeah, what they say. Yeah, this is not really – we're going to downplay our win here. And now we know that there are direct threats. We're probably going to get a decision on Roe v. Wade this week. If we get that decision this week, there are groups that are calling for people to riot. We reported yes. on it last night. What is Joe Biden, what are these big cities doing to protect people in light of a threat that we now know is public? Well, let me start with, with, with where you ended, which, it, which is I think the Supreme Court the next week is going to issue its decision. I think it's going to overturn Roe versus Wade. That's the right decision. Doesn't their session returns. end this week? Uh, they, they could do it next week. So, so it could be tomorrow. It could be next week. We, we, we don't know for sure when the, when the opinion will issue, but it's soon. It's, it, it's within the next few days. 
Um, that's the right decision. That will return the question of abortion to the elected legislatures. That's where the Constitution left it. That's where it belongs. But I think the response is exactly what you said, which is the organized left, they're going to engage in riots, they're going to get engaged in violence. We're going to see a reprise, I fear, of the Black Lives Matter and the Antifa riots, where they're going to try to use political violence to advance their ends. And the Department of Justice needs to step in and stop them. I halfway expect the attorney general to be rioting alongside them because this Department mm -hmm. of Justice has been so politicized. Now, you mentioned in the first... Okay. The, the layers of irony here are amazing that uh, Cruz is saying this stuff uh, as he's uh, talking about the show trials of January 6th, and he's talking about political violence. Um, I think they're also... I think they're also trying to say that the DOJ is politicized because I think they know that there's like some uh, political. I think they, they yeah. know that the subpoenas are starting to flow around January 6th. It's pre-working the refs. That's yes. what that is. Yeah. Um, and it's also sort of like completely diminishing the import of the Supreme Court reversing a right, an individual right that has been established for 50 years, 50 years. We have lived in this country with the right to an abortion, a constitutional right to abortion. This is the first time in the history of the country that the Constitution will be interpreted in a way to diminish uh, a, a, or reverse a right that had been established by the Supreme Court, certainly after 50 years. And they're worried about uh, Antifa uh, riots. I mean, this is what the, the, you know, it is basically like saying, like, I punch you in the face and I can't believe the way you reacted. I mean, I also wouldn't be surprised if they're trying to see the narrative that everyone protesting in the streets post this, you know, abortion being abortion rights being rolled back are Antifa, you know, Antifa fascist, uh, you know, equivalents on the left. Because for in reality, a lot of people are really pissed off. A lot of people who would normally not find themselves driven towards political action are finding themselves driven towards political action, you know, maybe for the first time, because like you said, this is a law being rolled back that despite constant warnings from uh, advocates around America, you know, people had in their head a thought this has been established, you know, this is established law, something like gay marriage for a lot of people. It's something that cannot be rolled back. And now we're seeing that a lot of the things that people take as civil rights are, you know, more or less constantly up for vote every four years, depending on the age of one to nine, uh, geri you know, geriatrics, more or less. So, you know, I, I think that the illusion that the Supreme Court was a stable vehicle for exercising the majority of our, you know, needs when it comes to civil rights is being rapidly proven to be just like false. Like even if we were to expand the court, you know, there's just too much, too much volatility there, you know, when it comes to like actually ensuring that people can plan for the future when it comes to things like family planning or, you know, well, yeah, I mean, the right to vote. I'm actually a little surprised that Ted Cruz didn't also uh, stuff in there uh, the security and lives of the Supreme Court justices, because that's another thing they tried to uh, shimmy this all towards over the yeah. past couple of weeks, because uh, one individual went down to Kavanaugh's home, didn't even bring his uh, gear with him, uh, was having a mental uh, episode and called the police from uh, blocks away to say, hey, I need you to pick me up. I'm having terrible thoughts. And all of a sudden that turned into uh, Mitch McConnell's got to pass that bill right away to save the lives of the Supreme Court justices. Of course, as the Supreme Court just votes today to strike down that New York gun law where, you know, uh, people could basically uh, ca conceal carry uh, wherever now. Uh, uh, can't have those uh, laws blocking that in uh, certain states that want that blocked like it is in New York. But um, apparently outside of a Supreme Court justice's house, that's 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 sacred ground. We can't have that going on there. Well, and and a Supreme Court justice uh, uh, lives on sacred ground. But uh, an election worker. Well, that's fair game. Right. Um, and that's basically, uh, you know, politics. That was the the nature of basically yesterday's um, uh, what we learned yesterday or the day before, I guess. Um, let me see if I can get a call in and we'll maybe take some IMs here. What's going on here? All right. 
Bear with me, folks. We will turn off the voicemail. And that sound signifies that the phones are on. Let's do some IMs, shall we, uh, folks? Um, Let's do it. You stop the stream. New stream request. Fun half link. No stream running. That was at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, we're we're on the. the okay, it's, it's everything's going. Uh, Bob Camardi <laughs> testing. Hope the IMs are working. Love you guys. I know you're talking about your ad buys, and I really appreciate you're not doing podcast AdSense on other shows. I listen to. Uh, I've started to doing that. It's only a matter of time before the Daily Wire and other right-wing propaganda outlets start buying ads on left-leaning progressive and central shows, hoping to harass and convert people. Uh, certainly happens on YouTube. Uh, Nick in Japan, happy Sam Majority Report Thursday. Big request for the MR app. Please give hapatic feedback. Hapatic feedback haptic? when we press send. Haptic. Haptic? What does that mean? It means it, means it vibrates. It's a little vibrate, yeah, to signify that you touched a command. Ah, and maybe time out the send button for a few seconds afterward to avoid repeat messages. Will you uh, just uh, send that note to, to Kyle? Why, Texas? Why? Emma is cool. Am I crazy for having a vague expectation that the apocalyptic disaster is near? I don't think so. <laughs> uh, Zipper Lanigan. <clears throat> what amazes me about this January 6th committee is the fact that the underlying underlings made the right decision of not going along with this scheme. They would have had to go to jail if they pulled it off. This would have been the only way for the Republican Party to justify why it's not uh, make it politically viable for Democrats to not do the same thing in the future election. That's how corrupt the Republican Party is. Oh, I see what you're saying. They would have gotten away with it, jailed some people as a message to Democrats in the future. Don't you try this or you'll get what these underlings got. Meanwhile, uh, that's President Trump's message. Call from a 360 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Veronica. I'm calling from Olympia. Veronica from Olympia. What's on your mind? Um, I actually was calling because I wanted to talk about a call that you had, I think, on Monday. Somebody was calling in, I believe, from Pennsylvania, and they were talking about uh, frustration about not having Democrats run in every district. Do you remember that? Yep. Um, I thought you gave a really great response to that, but I just wanted to give a little bit more. I've, I've done that. I've ran as a Democrat in a Republican district that I knew I wasn't going to win in. And I think it's important to do. It is a miserable experience as well. Yeah. So if, if people really want that to happen, you need to get active in your local legislative district uh, parties and your local county parties and all that. Because, you know, and I did that. I'm pretty active in my local stuff. But even in that case, everyone knew I was going to win. So nobody really wanted to help that much. It was really hard to stay motivated because nobody really wanted to help that much. And it's really hard to fundraise when you're calling, like, strong Democratic donors. And they're like, oh, you're running against him? Nah, I'm not. Just no. Um, because so they're you like, you're that, not, they, we know you're not going to win and we don't, we don't want to participate in building the party or, you know, subsidiary voters in that district. Yeah. Well, they just didn't think it was possible. Uh, the, like there were some unions that wouldn't back me because the guy, the incumbent was like not the worst Republican ever. Right. Um, and I did manage to get some endorsements just by being really passionate about building the party and acting like you can win everywhere. And I think that's really important. I just think that more people need to get involved in it to make it really feasible. So what 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 recommendation would you give someone who is, you know, thinking about doing that? Like, I mean, um, aside from being prepared for it to be a little bit miserable. <laughs> Well, um, first of all, I, lots of prep and lots of research. I kind of did it on a whim. I was sitting there the last day of filing week, refreshing the page, seeing if anybody would run. I did not want to win, run, right? But um, we had not only the incumbent, but an actual like fascist on the ticket uh, in, in the primary. And, and I did get him, I beat him, you know, I got on the general. So I, I kept the fascist. He was a three percenter um, leader before he ran for this. Uh, I kept him from being on the general ballot, which was... Well, now, so how did you do? Oh, 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 so you in the Democratic primary, you had like a uh, somebody. No, oh, sorry, I'm in Washington State, so we have top two primaries. Ah, oh, okay, okay, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, 
Yeah, so I'm in a really blue state. Well, they say it's blue, but it's only blue along the I-5 corridor. And I happen to live on the I-5 corridor in a little tiny finger of a very red district. Like I it, see. Oh, I don't I live see. there anymore. I but, see. Okay, you know. I Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, uh, so I just think that really planning ahead and making sure you have good support that will be there for you. Um, and some of the issues that I had personally was I felt guilty for asking people to help me because I knew I wasn't going to win. Right. And um, there were other races that were really important to me too. So it was hard to ask people for money. It was hard to ask people to come doorbell because I knew there was all these other great people running in other races that I really wanted to win. Usually I'll be out knocking doors for other people, right? That's, you know, I'm a, like a, you know, campaign volunteer and, you know, sometimes working mm -hmm. campaigns and stuff. So, mm -hmm. oh my goodness, my alarm's going off already. Sorry. Well, I mean, it sounds um, <laughs> like the important thing, though, was that you had a reason to run and you could articulate yeah. it. And so if you could justify it to yourself to take yourself off of, like, helping other campaigns, because this was important, that was, that was, that was your pitch to people. This is why it's important. Yeah. And, and And would you say, I know I'm going to lose, but... Uh, no, no, I was, I mean, you know, obviously in, in certain groups I would, you know, my, right. my close people, but um, I really tried not to say, of course, I'm going to lose. Everybody knew it, um, but like, so I was, the incumbent that I ran against um, is like our house minority leader. So one of the more um, powerful Republicans in our area. And so very what, rich, and, and, yeah. and, and why did you run? Well, uh, because this other guy that was running the primary, uh, do you remember the um, Borat thing where he came to Olympia, Washington, and there was that, like, some awful rally. I don't remember what it was for, guns or not wearing masks or something. And he got the uh, audience to sing along with uh, the racist stuff that he was saying. Throw the Jew down the well, was it? That, that was yeah, the first one. I don't remember movie. exactly what oh, it was. Okay. This is the second one. All right. He the went to an anti-vax rally. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, okay. the guy that like organized that rally was the like other guy in this race that I ran in. And so, uh, and you, you were So saying... that's why I ran, because I did not want him on the general ballot. I see. Fair enough. Because um, people were mad at the incumbent because he wasn't, you know, right-wing enough for them. So I was afraid of, like, somebody far to the right would do well. Uh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, well, that makes uh, yeah. uh, a lot of sense. And I think, you know, I've always been, you know, there it, there have been times where it's really not gone too much past a sort of joking around. Although at one point, I think even prior to my doing this show, um, uh, the, the, some folks had contemplated me running like a— uh, against an incumbent to take a little piece out of uh, their their numbers. And mm -hmm. I had wondered, like, if it didn't make sense to say, I'm, um, I, you know, you never say never. It's possible I could win. But the main reason I'm running is X, Y, or Z. To deny. Yeah, it's really person. hard to say that in the moment, though, like. <laughs> Yeah, no, I would imagine. I just wonder if it would. You, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm I'm completely, um, I, I don't know if it would be more effective or not. Yeah, I found that when I was doing the fundraising, the thing that was the most effective was saying, if we don't act like we can win, we can never win. This is important. There are Democratic voters in this district. We see them vote every year. We just don't give them someone to vote with yeah. or vote for. And that's you know, a huge issue. Do you know if there's any resources, uh, Travis from Pittsburgh is asking if there's any uh, resources on how to start a campaign, like a, even a checklist? Uh, uh, I'm sure there, I don't have anything off the top of my mind. I know that like the Democratic Party at the local level in my area has some things to help. I bet Indivisible run. might I really too. Indivisible or DSA, um, yeah. you know, I think those are going to be the best places. I don't, I, you know, I don't know about nationwide help for that sort of thing but there's always um trainings if you keep your ear to the ground there's always trainings there's people that want to get involved um i think it would be really hard if you're coming into it not knowing anybody in the area that's in local politics okay great all right well thanks for the call appreciate it all right thank you so much <laughs> have a great day okay I looked up the, the lyrics to that Borat sing along he had those right wingers singing to at Olympia, and I forgot about this. It was, it's so, 
<laughs> he had them saying CNN, they spread fake news. They're controlled by you know who is injected with the <laughs> Wuhan flu. Journalists, what we gonna do? Chop them up like the Saudis do. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> And they were singing this. Oh, People were cheering, God. yeah. That was before he got like whisked off the stage. He apparently, I think, in an interview said he was almost like he was almost like held at gunpoint at that rally. Oh my god. There's a weird coda to the Sasha Baron Cohen thing where he did try to do like a save democracy style like mini series as oh, yeah. Borat again and involving a bunch of these like crazy like sort of like prepper types. And I gotta say, the movie was genius. That series was very hard to watch because it, it wasn't going to be a successful experiment in trying to save the, some of those people he was pranking. Oh, he was he was like literally trying to like the guys he went to like the cabin with. He was like trying to like pull them out of like anti-vax stuff and stuff like that. And it's like this is almost doing worse. <laughs> That's almost like 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 Sarah's show, Sarah Silverman's show, uh, was sort of built on a similar premise. Like we can try and bring people together, and um, I'm afraid that is not. <laughs> Things fall apart. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes you just got to go with we're divided, and it's just a question of are we going to have a little bit more power than they are? Um, let's play this. Uh, there is. I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I can list about a half dozen uh, key Senate races around the country. The Democrats need to hold every seat. And um, they may lose a seat or two. Like it could be uh, Gene Shaheen in New Hampshire. Uh, it could be uh, 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 Masto. Uh, what's, I'm sorry. What's her name again? Thank you. Um, Catherine Cortez Masto. And I'm, Cortez I'm, I'm, double Masto. I'm double checking, Sam, but I think it actually might be Maggie Hassan running in New Hampshire. Oh, Maggie yeah, Hassan. Maggie yeah, Hassan. not Shaheen. Yeah. Uh, Maggie Hassan. Sorry. And uh, Cortez Masto in Nevada. Um, uh, uh, Kelly, Mark Kelly in Arizona. These are, are vulnerable Democrats uh, that could lose their seat. In uh, Pennsylvania, we could pick up one. Fetterman uh, right now is outpacing Oz. That could be good. I don't think Rubio is in any uh, danger. Uh, the last I heard, Val Demings is is attacking people who want to defund the police. I don't know like what that is supposed to do. Um, and... Uh, but Georgia is going to be a very important race. Uh, you've got uh, uh, Raphael Warnock uh, running against Herschel Walker. And Herschel Walker is trying to rebound from the fact that it turns out he has four kids, not one kid. And, uh, you know, oops. Um, and uh, all the criticism he had of absentee fathers. And it turns out, like... Oh, I'm one of those. Well... There's an argument that if you're an absentee father for more than one, you're in a different thing. It's a totally different category. Once you get to like three, <laughs> once you get into three, it's like you're almost, it's not even. Yeah. You, you almost like it's, it, the, you know, adding is a subtraction. Yeah, it's not, it wasn't, it wasn't two secret kids. It was two more secret kids. Right. <laughs> On top of the other secret kid. But like I say, adding is subtraction. Subtraction is adding. And sometimes that can get very confusing um, particularly when you think that the number of states in this country is equivalent to the number of cards in a card deck. <laughs> Let's play this audio. Different than, than Herschel Walker they're on, they're on the, band in their uh, on the uh, Travis, Clay Travis and Buck Sexton show that uh, <laughs> has a name there. came in to fill in for Limbaugh. This is the Limbaugh replacement. Oof. What, we, what do you tell them is going to be different from uh, what they what they've been getting in terms of their representation as Georgians at the federal government from uh, Raphael Warnock. Well, I think what they're going to get different, and I want them to know that. Don't think that they abandoned their party by voting for me because their party abandoned them. They're not abandoning their party because they're voting for me. What they're doing, they're voting for someone that care about this country, and I care about them because they're my family. I don't care what color you are; you're my family, and I was taught from my parents to take care of your family. Right now, my family is hurting. They're hurting from the crime on the street. They're hurting from this border being wide open. They're hurting from the gas prices. They're hurting from the grocery prices. Well, those are things I want to fight because, you know, I'm not here to get put another feather in my cap. I'm not here to try to get a pat on the back. 
I'm not here to make friends in the Senate and be walking around eating dinners. What I want to do is get this country fixed. And that's what I told people when I was going to run. There's other things I can be doing right now. But I know I can beat Senator Warren or not. He knows it as well. If he didn't know that, they wouldn't be going after me like they're going after me because then they'll be worried about fixing what's going on. But yet they want to continue to talk about me rather than talking about the gas prices, continue to talk about me rather than talking about you can't eat, continue to talk about me rather than fixing the border. There are so many things that they have to do that they can get done. It's simple. That's what's so funny. This is simple. Like, if you want to get the gas prices right, let's start drilling in our own country. Let's take care of ourselves. You want to get this border right, at least go down there and look at the laws on the book. You know, the, you know. I, I think the vice president was supposed to be down there fixing the border. Where is she at today? You know, she's not even trying. And I said, that's what makes it so angry. They're not even trying to make it better, and they're making excuses that they're not doing it. Herschel, I know you're not running against Stacey Abrams. Brian Kemp is. I love the state of Georgia. I spend a lot of time down here. Obviously, I live in Tennessee. I wish my volunteers would win a few more games against your Bulldogs. We'll see if that ever happens well, that again. That may not happen soon, but that's okay. <laughs> but she said Georgia was the worst state in the United States. And Warnock is running alongside of Stacey Abrams. Yes. They're a team, just like you and Brian Kemp are a team right now running this fall. What did you think? as somebody who grew up in Georgia and has spent much of your life here, when she said Georgia was the worst state in the well, country. Well, it, it was totally insulting. It's insulting because you said it's the worst state to, and, and that you know of, and yet you're running for office here. And then you have Senator Warnock running right along with him. And I was at a police uh, at a police equi- uh, a, uh, I was at a police uh, banquet. And what was so funny about that, they invited uh, Ms. Abrams and they invited uh, Senator Warnock. Neither one of them showed up. Yep. They didn't even show up to support the police. We got to support our men and women in blue. Like it or not, they, they work for so much little, yet they do so much, and you don't want to support them. And I said, that is a problem. I want people of Georgia to know that. If you want to get this Georgia back together, you want to get this country back together, you got to vote for people that believes in this country. And if you don't believe in the country, leave and go somewhere else. If it's a worse state, why are you, why are you here? Why don't you leave? Go to another. That's what, 51 more other states you can go to. You don't have to be. Well, there, he said, uh, and that was a long way to go for that, but he said, um, uh, what are there, 51 other states outside of Georgia? Right, so 52 in total. I love the 52 states. The There's the full 52 uh, and, and 54 if you include both jokers. <laughs> right, I mean, right. Clearly, he's advocating for making Puerto Rico and D.C. into states post his election. So, I mean, I think that we can support that if, you know, we agree on those terms. I will say, though, in that entire speech, he said that he was not going to go to fancy dinners. Then he came out and said that he did go to a fancy dinner at the end. So, you know, he's a flip flopper. He's a flip flopper. uh, But someone should ask him about that with uh, Puerto Rico and... uh, Fancy well, maybe, maybe the cops are okay, though. That's okay. Maybe Banquet. he just got confused Banquet. and remember. Maybe he just got confused and remembered some more secret kids, and that was the number he was rattling off. Uh, you know, but the, but the thing he's saying about uh, he was saying about Stacey Abrams is I was looking that up because I had not heard about this. That Stacey Abrams said that Georgia's the worst. Uh, she was talking about. Uh, healthcare incarceration rates, like uh, maternal mor- mortality that Georgia is ranked the worst in the country to live when it comes to those things. Like, for instance, but, Georgia is has the highest uh, HIV rates per 100,000 people. So, like, it'd be nice if, uh, yeah. You, why did Matt Leck say Georgia's the highest? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you might want to move, Matt. <laughs> right, but, oh, people but, smoke too much pot. Is that why it's the highest? This, this is rich coming from him, though, the idea that, you know, you can't say these things and that America is the best and you shouldn't be running unless America is the best or George is the best. Um, I, I just sent you a clip in the uh, chat. Can you play that clip, uh, Bradley? Because this is uh, Herschel Walker. Also. Uh, thing, Give me a second. We got a transfer from Ping. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, I think that his position makes a lot of sense because, you know, a lot of the problem is government overreach, like he's saying. Uh, he believes that Georgians are his family. He's going to, therefore, you know, take a hands-off approach to Georgians the same way he takes a hands-off approach to raising his many secret children. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all in line with the Republicans' uh, ideology. If, if Georgians are his family, does that mean that um, uh, three-quarters of them have to move out of state and— uh... 
<laughs> and live somewhere else. And keep it, yeah, keep it quiet. And, yeah, and also on the hush hush. Don't tell anybody in Tennessee you're here. You can move and go live with one of my fifty one other kids. <laughs> you don't have to move, but you certainly <laughs> won't be acknowledged by him if you stay. So it's you know it's up to you. Here is uh, Herschel Walker, and um, it, 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 what's he saying? He's asked like what, where he ranks the U.S. in terms of like world countries, like where they are right now. This was how long ago? Do we know? Like... This was either today or yesterday. Okay. Oui. But I know I can I can win this seat, and I think right now I want to try to help this country to get back together. And you hear what I said? I want to help this country and help the people get this country back together because right now we're better than what people are making us out to be. You know, right now America is second, third, or fourth. But you know, when America lead, I think the whole world is doing well. Right whoa! Now, lead, so it doesn't seem to be whoa! 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 <laughs> America is second. fourth. Fourth? Behind who? <laughs> Herschel Walker's saying America's fourth? I want to know who's first. Yeah, who's better than us, Herschel? Who's better than uh, America? Name names. Well, I mean, let's, let's, uh, I mean, let's speculate. Let's go around. Who does Herschel Walker think is better than America? What are the first, like, it, I wonder if one of them is like a, like a place where like Bermuda, where like you could have offshore accounts or something. Yeah. The uh, Cayman oh, Islands, Cayman, Cayman, <laughs> Panama, you know, Panama. a lot of tax, a lot of tax, <laughs> tax havens uh, popping up every day. Um, I wonder what uh, what other countries Herschel Walker thinks is better than America. That's who, messed up, who man. Who passed us, Herschel? He's starting to sound like Stacey Abrams. Europe? Here. Scandinavia? Belgium, Belgium has great waffles. Sweden? The country, Georgia. The country, Georgia. <laughs> Home of Stalin. I, 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 I mean... If there was, you know, if there was, uh, uh, again, this is one of those situations where it's like, if this was Republicans, it, they would be out there right now with Herschel Walker saying that America is number four. Who's number one, two, and three, Herschel? Why don't you tell us? And why don't you run for Senate there? Exactly. If you're not why, first, you're last, Herschel. Uh, or these three secret countries that you can't tell us about that you support secretly without making it public because you don't want to be embarrassed one was disclosed initially but now the other two have been disclosed <laughs> where did these countries come from relations with other countries that have these countries right and how do we know he really thinks that we're fourth maybe there's some secret countries that come before us even maybe we're actually in fifth or sixth or that's seventh, right maybe <laughs> how do we know that two weeks from now we won't find out that we're actually eighth <laughs> that's I mean, that's really what we should be seeing um oh this is important stuff listen um we weren't going to talk about this but Apparently, Lauren Boebert <clears throat> has declared that she was never a prostitute, never had multiple abortions, um, never been a stripper. Now, I want to make this clear. Uh, frankly, I don't care about what uh, work she had in the past, as long as, as she doesn't feel like she was exploited in any way. Mm. I think some of this might help with some government regulation. Um, and apparently, uh, well, let's just say this. She is, let's play this, let's let's play her denial. Uh, first, she is on the Tommy Lauren uh, show. Uh, Tommy Lauren, if you're not aware of this, is fearless. Uh, we know this because there's a neon sign that says it. She's really, fallen in the, show. On her She's really fallen in the conservative ranks. It's amazing. She was yeah. like the, the new like flavor of the month for a while. And all of a sudden she's nowhere to be found. Yeah, she's what like, is well, she's on Outkick? So funnily enough, that? funnily enough, if I'm not mistaken, Outkick is actually Clay Travis's who we just heard with Herschel Walker, his network. So because yep. like, he branched off from Fox Sports, I believe. Um, so now this is his like own um, you know, it's like a conservative sports show, yeah, yeah or the sports yeah. Uh, it's like, website, it's, yeah, yeah, like barstool sports, but without like any sort of sense of like popularity. Among them. <laughs> well, wasn't like Tommy Lauren expelled from the Blaze because she came out like pro choice like forever ago? Like she oh, was yeah. yeah, yeah, like I think there was um, something like and then she was like, she was just pro-choice because you know a lot of people are, and they just kind of like, shh, you know, her career. All right, well, let's hear uh, Lauren Bobert's denials. 
So I know some of the backstory of what happened here, but can you just set the record straight once and for all for my viewers on this whole nonsense about you being an escort on a sugar daddy website for crying out loud? Right, uh, Tommy, these are all lies. And you know, isn't it interesting that this is coming from the party of believe all women. I am not the only one that this has happened to. Uh, we, we know Pause it for lied. one second. We will play the Democratic officials who come out and have said that she's a sugar daddy website on a, we'll play that after this. Right, uh, Tommy, these are all lies. And you know, isn't it interesting that this is coming from the party of believe all women. I am not the only one that this has happened to. Uh, we, we know that they've lied about you, as you stated. They've lied about Sarah Palin and nearly every conservative fighter. Heck, even Mother Jones, a far left leaning publication, called these sexist and disgusting claims. Conservative women are targets of the mainstream media, but that makes us so much stronger. I've never had two abortions. I've never had any abortions. I've never been an escort. I've never been a drug addict, as they claim, a stripper or whatever else they want to add to that. And over the last few days, verifiable facts uh, will be released that prove what I said. That proves that uh, these allegations are absolutely false. But here's what's so sad, Tommy. The damage has been done. These allegations trended number one on Twitter. Okay. Um... And so she's saying that in a few days, she's going to have verifiable proof that she did not have abortions or was never a stripper. Or I, I mean, I don't. Can I just say, like, if I was her staff, uh, you know, leading her staff, I would say, could we just like not ag acknowledge these <laughs> accusations that are completely bullshit? It seems weird. This is a weird way to go about it because it is only on Twitter. And, um, you know, there's all sorts of BS that's on Twitter at times. And I don't know how, I think it's unfair for her to be in a position where she has to prove that she didn't get an abortion. That's, uh, I don't know how you Strange, do that. Yeah. I don't know how you prove that you were never a stripper or a, um, or anything else for that matter. I mean, how would I, how would, how would anybody prove that? It's proving a negative. I, you can't really do that. But I would say. Is, I'm sorry. Let's just show a clip of the mainstream media that is uh, that, uh, you know, levied these charges. And it's. Um, it's a it's a document. Uh, president of the American Muckrakers Pack. Are the same people who went after <laughs> Madison Cawthorn? Yes. Uh, it is exactly. the same people who went after Madison Cawthorn after he threatened to blow the whistle on Republican lawmakers about their. Um, their uh, drug and uh, sex uh, parties. It's weird that they're going after Bobert. And both Cawthorn and Bobert said that this was coming from the left when it was really just apparently coming from the right. I mean, do we know anything about this pack? The only thing I, I think they're associated with loosely is like that Occupy Dems account on Twitter, which is which is like kind of like kind of like awful, like baseless, like oh, yeah, news that's a horrible aggregating. Account. Yeah. So the, but also all this is to point to is that like it's not coming from, you know, any sort of institutional or, you know, elected official. This is not really super to, to say this is credible or this is eminently credible. And there is 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 her over inflating the importance of this account. It's also just weird that like you're responding to this outfit and yes, uh, like, exactly. like Lauren Boebert, like I did, I had a tweet that was, uh, you know, going into her giving 80 plus people uh, blood, um, uh, vi violent uh, stomach pains with bad uh, pork sliders uh, for her catering business. She didn't respond to that at all. Like, hmm. <laughs> or that well, her landlord I'm, now is mad at her in, in Colorado, her new landlord for her restaurant and that they might have to close up shop. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, this is the first time hearing about any of these accusations and they're all very specific. And, you know, I would, you know, if I were, as Matt said, the head of her PR per, uh, team, I'd be like, hey, you know, the first time any, if in, the first time some people are going to hear these accusations are going to be coming out of your mouth, that's just going to give them more legitimacy than if, you know, some random account tweets them out. But, you know, maybe she's trying to get ahead of something that's going to come out. If you go, if you put Lauren Bobbert into Twitter, all I get stuff is about her, like, terrible restaurant that gives people diarrhea. So, you know, <laughs> being closed down. So, like, maybe she's just trying to distract from that. It's all very... Although yeah, I do I mean, like I, how I, she implies... So you're saying Republican this is Party. a diarrhea whitewash? Well, I mean, 
a brown washing. It's a limited a brown wash, a brown wash, brown wash. Yeah, I mean, I heard about these accusations, uh, and there was not there was nothing there. Like I saw them online, and I know they came from Madison, the the guys who went after Madison Cawthorn, but there's there's like there was like nothing there. Like they they dripped stuff out, like evidence and visual stuff about Madison Cawthorn, and then they uh, did not do the same for Bobert. It's just like that document is literally all they have, um, or at least yeah. all they've released, I should say. But yeah, it's well, weird that she would bring this up. It show it also shows just how like uh social media brained these uh new like uh republicans are they're like so enwrapped in this bubble without realizing that like regular people uh have no idea what she's talking about i mean i actually the the interesting story i recently saw about her was a source uh you know and the daily beast covered this as well a source went to the daily mail apparently and uh, this was uh, also employees at her restaurant said they remembered her clocking in with broken teeth and visible facial in in injuries. Back in 2020, right before her primary, she apparently ditched her own children after a Jeep ATV accident because she didn't want to get involved in any publicity for uh, you know what was, would come out of the accident and what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So she basically left her hurt kids inside this Jeep ATV and, 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 and left the scene of the uh, accident. Oh my God. Uh, I mean, she bailed while it was crashing, right? And then, like, her friend and the kids were still in the crashing ATV. A, so a source told the outlet that Bobert, uh, who has a history of reckless driving, hit a rock wall, badly injuring her then sister-in-law. Bobert then bailed, the source said, leaving uh, Hooper, her sister-in-law, screaming and freaking out. Uh, Hooper's mother confirmed the incident to the Daily Mail, saying that her daughter got stuck inside of a crevice in the Jeep while Lauren took off her belt and slipped out. I, I, I actually misread it. I thought it was her own kids, but it's even worse. Like her, her you know, maybe not worse, but it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, her sister-in-law. That's horrible. This initiative. Is, uh, Jesus. Uh, initiative. I have some you got us initiative. I get some information on uh, on the American P Muckrakers pack. Uh, it is um, a guy from originally from Iowa, a guy named David B. Wheeler. He uh, ran as a Democrat, I think, in a state Senate race. I'm not sure in what state. Um, and he is a co-founder of the, of the thing. I mean, it, it, it seems to me, I look at this document about the pack. It's making very specific claims against Bobert. Now she is a public figure, but if you know these things not to be true, this is a big defamation suit. It seems to me. Yeah. And I didn't she threaten legal activity, but did she ever file? That seems like odd behavior. I mean, it, it, this seems like low hanging fruit. Every time something like this happens, where litigation is threatened, the, I think you may have either mentioned this yesterday or the day before, Sam. I don't remember about Bobert or someone else, but everything I always think of is discovery. They never ever wanted to go there. Like they're never actually going to try and yes. get it to go this far because who knows what'll come out. It, it seems to me that if you get these type of specific allegations, these are very, very specific. Um, she owes her employees back pay and threatens them if they protest. She uses donor money to pay her taxes and restaurant rent. She does. Um, I mean, this is, these are pretty specific uh, accusations. It seems to me that the way you respond to these is not go, on Tommy Lawrence show, you go and you sue. Yeah, and, and don't talk about it publicly. <laughs> Say, I don't need to talk about this. Um, talk yeah, talk to my lawyer. I mean, uh, uh, somebody says um, her lawyer has never threatened to litigate, just made uh, an anodyne uh, denials. Very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'm, it, I'm... it wasn't Bobert that showed up with the bust face. It was her sister-in-law that she messed up in that wreck. Uh, right, uh, right. Well, interesting. Uh, interesting. Let's take uh, one more phone call. Call from a 928 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Brian from Flagstaff. Brian from Flagstaff. What's on your mind, Brian? Yeah. We'd... Well, uh, I think that the problem is uh, the uh, <clears throat> Civil War never got finished. They surrendered, but never... Uh, um, never uh, accum or never uh, assimilated. 
The the real failure was it, during um, uh, Reconstruction. Yeah. And yeah. that was a function of uh, Johnson in many respects, yeah, I think. We failed Reconstruction, and then West, white supremacy was restored yep. uh, among, or along corporate lines. Well, yeah, but, I mean, this is, I think, what leads to just about every problem we have, including guns and the religious right with the um, abortions and all that. I think that it all comes from that. And uh, they are definitely uh, declaring war against the left. I mean, they're saying it every day, pretty much. I'll, right? I, I, I agree. Um, we should go back and listen. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, Professor uh, David Wright on, right? Was it uh, David Wright from Yale? Uh, talking about Reconstruction. Uh, I believe we had him on maybe talking about Frederick Douglass, but I also feel that we, we talked about Reconstruction. Uh, and Eric Foner, you should you should listen to those interviews because you'll see there was an opportunity, um, and uh, and 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 we failed uh, in you know in reorienting the country. Uh, we didn't um, require the proper accounting from these states. Uh, they were defeated in war. They should have been occupied by the Union Army, and and frankly, when a lot of these southern states had hard coups, hard coups, violent coups to um, Wilmington, North Carolina is one. Uh, we had a couple others that we mentioned just the other day. I can't even remember off the top of my head. Wilmington and uh, Grimes, Texas, others. Um, the Union Army should have been in there and, uh, you know, consolidating their, their, their power. But uh, I, I agree with you. I appreciate the call. Well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. The uh, Union Army is still here. I mean, if they're building their own armies, shouldn't we just get our Union Army back into it? I mean, who's I building mean, uh, their own armies? Well, the Proud Boys, the all the the right is building all these militias and armies, and they're building up guns. And I mean, that's where the problem is, right? Well, we have uh, police, and we have uh, you know. I guess wow. National Guards, and uh, we have uh, other people who, who deal with this. Well, the police are pretty much on, on the, the, right. the other side. I mean, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that, that's not a good, but uh, the Army should have all the liberal North uh, Union ideals because this is the first place that got integrated with, uh, you know, racial and, uh, you know, all the other stuff. I, I mean, the, I, you I, know, that was. I, yeah, I mean, I guess there, there's a lot of shoulds that, that should be going on as far as I'm concerned, but I'm not sure I understand what the point is. Well, the point is, is that they are doing acts of war every day, pretty much, well, every week, pretty much. I mean, you know, July 6th was, or January 6th was definitely an act of war, wasn't it? I mean, they're not a nation so there's not i mean i you know i don't know like w w it's not an act of war it is i think it was a soft coup uh that was backed with a you know a, a violent insurrection that's what i would say it is do i think they should be held to account yes uh, some of those proud boys are their court date was just pushed back because there's more information being gathered by january 6th I think the attorney general, uh, uh, the D Department of Justice should continue to subpoena people. And I think people should go to jail. I, I don't think that we should but, bring tanks out to fire it, you know, no. in the general direction of people. No, I don't think so either. But I think that uh, if they are doing acts of war and the, the Proud Boys are the Republican I just said Party, it's not an nothing. act of war. That's not, it's yeah. not an act of war. I just said it's, it was an insurrection and it was criminal activity. It was an act of politics. Like, I think where you're going wrong, caller, is when you said, like, the problem is, like, the Proud Boys and these militias. Like, I think those are a symptom. I think the problem is the re reactionary leadership in the country that wants to instrumentalize those sorts of groups. Oh, I agree. And yeah. so, yeah. I totally agree. But, I mean, whenever it's a white supremacist um, shooting down a, a a uh, church or running over a girl in Charleston or Buffalo or any of that, that all goes to the South. That all, that's all the, the South needs to own all that stuff. That's not North people that are giving those people the idea that white people are supreme. 
I know mean, what I mean, there are some. Well, North no, there's a lot of them. A lot of those, <laughs> I, I, a lot I mean, of those think... Proud Boys are on the West Coast, too. Like, that's major, like, uh, right wing, the Patriot a Prayer people. Uh, Patriot Front is from yeah. all over. A lot yeah, of them Gavin are on the McGinnis. West Coast. Gavin yeah. McGinnis, I don't know if he's ever been, uh, you know, south of, uh, of and I'm, uh, of, and I'm of, of, of DC, I don't know, but and I'm pretty sure the guy who run who ran over true. Heather Hare in uh he, Heather Hare in um in, at Charlottesville, I'm pretty sure he was from Ohio. So yeah, there it's not really but it's not yeah. geographical. I'm talking about, I'm talking about ideology. All that ideology. Well, why do you keep using geography? Because the South is what we were fighting when it was South and North. I, okay, I appreciate the, I appreciate geology. the phone call. I, I, I'm not. Uh, what, what are you suggesting that we do? I'm suggesting that we got to. They're getting tough, and we're not getting tough. We're we're viewed as the weak party, and this is why. I believe. I mean, I could be wrong, and you could be right, but we are viewed as the weak party, aren't we? The liberals. Well, what are do you the mean weak? by weak party? I don't understand. Like the, I don't understand the terminology that you're talking about. Like, like, are, are you saying that the the jets are coming? And we've got to buck up, sharks. And like, I, I mean, what, what, what do you mean? I'm I saying think the guy, needs... the, the congressman that was running for office and beat up the reporter when he asked about health care. That that guy got elected because he beat up the reporter about health care. That's not why he got elected. No, he got elected because it's a right? Republican state That's that not, votes yeah. for the Republican yeah. uh, 99.9% of the time. Even the ones that don't beat up reporters. Yes. But I mean, in the, terms of like, in terms of like Democrats that, getting, say, oh my God, he beat up a reporter. So let me ask you this: one. Do you think that if Chuck Schumer <laughs> was to go, was to go, <laughs> and beat up a reporter, that maybe he could run for president? Say Felix Salmon. Honestly, if Chuck no, Schumer did that, I think he could. If... No, I didn't say that. <laughs> no, I'm, but I'm, I'm not. <laughs> if you're saying that, like. There's too many soy boys running around here. I mean, maybe you're right. First of I mean, all, I, 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 I no, personally I think, am going to no, fuck I, up. I, no, I think what he's saying, honestly, is that Democrat. But but this is this is about policy. Then, like Democrats are weak and push. Like the, the fact that Nancy Pelosi's out there saying, like, oh, we need a strong I Republican agree with that. party. Like that is like you don't see oh, any Pelosi Republicans out there saying cream. that. I mean, come on, saying that. I don't, yeah. I'm not just ragging on Pelosi because I got to show my Pelosi love here too. But uh, you know, in general, like that's the sort of Democratic thing that we're like they they believe that the country is stronger with two parties and the republicans are out there going hell yeah. yeah we should have like an authoritarian donald trump and it should be all us all the time like yeah, yeah. i guess if, if that's what you're talking about i yes, agree with definitely that definitely the yes. democrats need to yes. get tough there but, but i don't think that war yeah like i don't want to war see Chuck or Schumer we need to have politicians who are beating up reporters i i just don't think that makes yeah. sense well, um, uh, it makes sense, uh, you know, and this was such a jovial fun half. I feel bad about bringing it down. I really do <laughs> because it was, I mean, it was going so well and I felt bad about waiting on line for, or waiting on the phone line for that long just to bring it down. Sorry. But um, I don't know. I mean, it's the, we, the Democrats and the Republicans, I mean, they switched the parties back in the sixties because of the equal rights right. movements and, um, everybody has problems, but the red states down in the south are basically the South rising again. They, I mean, I, I, I think there's, the I think there's, some, I think there's some. I, I mean, I think broadly speaking, there's some truth, you know, to your analysis. It's it's a little bit uh, general, but I mean, I think yes, broadly speaking, that's the case. I just don't think that like framing it in the context of war and you know beating up reporters from North Dakota. Uh, are is really the the way to go? But yes, do Democrats need if, to get more of a spine? Another way do to they need to the civil war? I'm all I'm all ears, man. Uh, no, well, I, I appreciate I, I appreciate the call. I'm gonna let you go. That's been ten minutes. I appreciate it. Thank you. I think I just I think don't the, think we should get back into it. I, I think uh, the better way to frame that, though, caller, to, to leave it here, I guess, is like, yeah, that stuff, like, uh, uh, you know, obviously that didn't probably do anything to that election. But, yeah, the Republicans, at least that we see online, uh, certainly liked seeing that uh, that guy beat up the reporter. Sure, that's what speaks to them. But what speaks to people on the left and progressives would be Democrats growing a spine when it comes to pushing for policy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we don't want to see Democrats, uh, you know. You, you know, emulating what the Republicans do when it comes to that type of stuff. No, yeah, that's like not going to speak to the the uh, progressives or even the Democratic base. On the Civil War, like that that 
the, that perception of like the Confederates were the strong guys who know how to shoot guns and ride horses, and all these Northerners don't know how to do stuff. That was existent back then too. And you know why they lost is because people power and they were ultimately not on the side of justice and lost that. Um, like I think that th that's the important thing is like when you have the side of the people and justice on your side, you act like Ulysses Grant and Sherman did. It's not about like let's all get guns and go restart the Civil War. I I think that's I I just don't think it's. I don't think he's thinking practical. Also, take it right, from us that, Northerners. What did Northerners that one act of racist. him? Right. What did that one act of him body slamming a reporter actually do in the long run for anybody? However, if Democrats actually got tough on policy, people would see the reverberations of that throughout the rest of you know their lives for as long as that policy existed. I don't think it's even. I mean, I do. I, I agree with that. But I would also add that they need to get tough on politics too. Well, I mean, they need to they need to play. They need to be better at politics. But that's I think the that, arena. It, it I was think that, that like, threat that caused the Confederates to leave the Union in the first place. And I think that's the model here, too, is we need to push for justice as far as we can until the reactionary rump breaks off, and then we deal with that reactionary rump. That is uh, the phone call portion of our program today. Uh, did you say reactionary Harris. rump? I did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> new new I am, new screen name. That's new like, I am, screen uh, name. It's like uh, <laughs> the, the dead enders. All right. 10 IMs, then we'll be out of here. And I guess uh, we lost Brandon. Uh, yeah, yeah. He he, his, internet, his internet dropped, so he's oh, trying okay. to get back in. But if not, it's okay. okay. Uh, JB Davis, 65. Good Shabbos. Uh, it's, it's, it's Thursday. Um, Oliver Wendell, Home Slice. Usually the show is divided up into two halves, the depressing half and the other depressing half, with jokes about Dave Rubin, but watching Ron Johnson get busted, not knowing how a cell phone works. Absolutely made yesterday special. Yeah, the, the, we did a deep dive into Ron Johnson. That dude, that dude should be arrested. <laughs> Below me. Sam, we don't need this interview because the real causes of inflation, because Larry Summers is already on it and says 10 million people need to lose their jobs. God, what a horrible human being. Salty Bird, given the Supreme Court's ruling, what are your thoughts about making sizable donations to organizations like the Huey P. Newton Gun Club? I mean, I, I, I really honestly don't know what what we do about that. Max in the BK, I don't agree with the decision. It will be awful for the health and safety of black people, but we need to acknowledge the role of police in discriminatory way they issued these permits, which allowed for briefs from left entities like public defenders. This is true. I actually did some interviews about this at the time uh, on the uh, Peacock show to support stripping these regulations. We desperately need to shrink the role of police. It's the root of so much that's plaguing us now. They, listen, it is the case that the public defenders had an amicus brief on this case because they felt the way that these permits were issued was discriminatory. And um, in terms of whether you uh, had a legitimate reason to carry a weapon. And in my estimation, and, and it may have, I don't know, I haven't read the decisions fully. It may have given cover to some degree. But the Supreme Court was going to make this decision regardless of what the uh, public defender said. And um, it is the case that there was, it was discriminatory. I'm sure of it. My solution is no one gets that permit. Or you make very, very specific guidelines as to what's established to the point where you could almost have it be an algorithm. Um, and, and you make sure that that algorithm is tested for not to have a racial bias. Appinva. Appin, Appinva. Appin, A-P in Virginia. How's that? Hi, Sam and crew. Did you see what Dorr said about Colombia's Petro and Marquez being faux progressives and Hernandez being the real deal populist? Can't believe you made be Dor he made Dorr be this way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I, I didn't see that. Yeah, apparently the, uh, the, the new leader of Colombia is a, is a lib cuck. So. <laughs> lib cuck, yes. We should continue to not elect anybody to the left of right-wing fascists there. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure he was told this by someone who does stand-up. Uh, Louis, nice of Michael Giannis to throw no Mickey under the bus yesterday for the duplicitous grifter Kristen Gonzalez. I don't, who's, who's Michael Giannis? 
He's a state senator in Queens. Oh, uh, even Bill Clinton would have been taken aback at some of the BS Gonzalez is spouting in her campaign bio. How can someone delete her LinkedIn account before entering a race and not raise any eyebrows other than the effing New York Post? It's pathetic. All the years of good work Nomiki has done in the community gets demissed for identity politics and no other reason. Sad. I mean, look, um, I, I, I don't know uh, about what uh, Giannaris did. I think the argument is that when you are electing a state senator— you're also electing the institutional heft behind it and that no one senator is going to do, uh, you know, anything. It is going to take someone who is going, you know, in there in a coalition. And there are people who feel like the endorsements um, provided that. Um, with that said, you know, this is a, a fairly local seat and, you know, having relationships with the community is also very important. Um, so, uh, you know, I'd probably say relaxed a little bit too. Um, yeah, that was a bit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was... The 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 level of heat on both sides of this uh, argument, I think, are uh, a little bit extreme. Um, there are four people in the race too, so uh, you know, it's it's unclear to me, you know. The, you know, I, I have no sense of the dynamic of the race. North Dakota Llama, thanks for getting uh, uh, Amani, uh, Aman uh, Badhaso lined up. I both follow uh, Minnesota and North Dakota politics closely. And while Betty McCollum is better than most on the Democratic sides of things, I feel she's got more and more passive at times goes on. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, look. And what Imani's hitting on, I think, is the uh, good things to be pressuring Democrats on. Exactly. And, and particularly, like, when there is no chance of a Republican winning in that seat, it is crucial for these seats to be as far left and anti-corporate as possible. I mean, that is just, like, the bottom line. Uh, Linso from St. Paul. Go, Monty. I hope she destroys McCollum. You're right, Sam. Minnesota is purple, really blue toward the Twin Cities, but way out in the country and basically Wisconsin. And, and my other sort of subsidiary argument to that is when you've got a state that is a blue state, you want to maximize those blue districts or a purple state. You want to maximize those blue districts. Anybody who's coming to vote for McCollum is already going to vote. They're going to vote for the, the Democrat. But she but but uh, but Hasso has the opportunity to bring in people who and introduce them into the system, introduce them into voting. And so I don't know if that means there's going to be 100 more votes for who is at the top of the ticket or 200 or 500 or 1,000. But those votes count. 1,000 extra votes in a state like Minnesota could be huge, particularly in 2024. All right, three more. Emma's in the shadows. Not sure what kind of donuts Brandon is looking for, but two recommendations. Dough in bed style or Peter Pan donuts in Greenpoint. All right. Good. Good to know. Jay Tingle. David Blight. Thank you. Plainly, Walker did the math in his head and added one to 50 instead of subtracting. Sam, you're in no position to make any hay from someone else's math issues. <laughs> Jen Hexer. <laughs> you need to have me co-host when Emma is out you, to break up the sausage fest you got going on. The final I am of the day. What what is it that I, I say in the uh, the fun half intro? I say something related to this. I say something like, "It looks like it's the boys today," or something like that. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it is from Charlie. The other founder ran against Cawthorn last election. Ah, the other founder of oh the the fire bober. Yeah. Oh no, the uh, the pack. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Matt. Bradley, Matt, Brandon, and Abstentia, great job today. See you folks tomorrow. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the life bar. Don't get paid for the road.